Down there, down there. Uh, for most of this, I'm actually probably just going to sit at the front, only because I've got the little recordery thing, and I managed to get a taller ice cream or a box to put it on. I can switch that over, but uh, I don't think you'll see my face for most of it anyway. So I'm just going to sit down here for for, uh, for most of that. So oh, there's a little microphone. Uh, what do we call it? Webcam for anyone in the class. All right. So the first things first. So, so this lecture is live stream. So if you don't happen to be here on any particular day. You can just type in. Uh, I've sent the link out in uh, a few announcements, or if you just go to YouTube, just type my first name, surname, and just JCU. I was sitting at a friend's place on Netflix. Say that right? Netflix the other day, trying to see where I ranked in terms of the Simon Walkers in the world, and it turned out 206th. I typed in my name, flicked, flicked through 206 times before uh, getting some. Um, uh, getting any of this material. Okay, so, that, so that's the first thing. Um, just note that if you are, and for, the, for all those that are, do happen to be on the external stream, any of you guys on your laptops, you can just type messages on there, and they'll pop up on there. There is a bit of a delay, because you can imagine, this is streaming from OBS, going off to YouTube, chugs around a little bit, and then um, then can stream back up there. So if, I, if you guys are external, for a, even if it's just for one particular day, uh, you just make note there is that delay. Um, so we found last year it worked okay. I wouldn't say it was a spectacular success in terms of having it. It is quite funny. Uh, I mean, you'll find throughout the, the course of uh, the semester, you'll start to get to know uh, people in class and you'll start to, I don't know, sometimes be a bit jovial with each other. And so reaching that point where we're making jokes about people who aren't there and then we realize they are actually there and they pipe up and say, no, actually, awkward. Okay, uh, so that's the first thing. So you'll, Welcome all on Sundry. For now, for you guys, for most of you guys, you're enrolled in the, the, the MPA, the Master of Business Administration, or the uh, uh, MPA, it's the MBA is Master of Business Administration, or MPA, Master of Professional Accounting. Okay, uh, so that, and for, and for most of you guys are aware that that particular qualification is one that is one of those boxes you can tick to be uh, an accountant, to be a CA or a CPA in Australia uh, for now. What that means is that this subject, like a host of other university subjects that you'll come up with from time to time, is uh, created and structured and taught in one school, one area, one discipline. But it's really for the benefit of and for the professional qualifications of another. Um, so that in this case, it is taught exclusively by law staff. Um, I'm a well, I am, a, strictly speaking, I'm a solicitor, but really I'm a legal academic. Um, but I have an accounting background. Um, so I have a, uh, three undergraduate degrees with five majors, one of which is in accounting. And I very foolishly decided to not do the accounting professional exams. So I finished the qualification back in 2004. And so I wholeheartedly regret doing that. I did the equivalent subject um, in the undergrad for a business degree many, many years ago. And I'm a Kiwi, in case you can't tell by my accents. Um, and so it's, um, otherwise it's pretty, light, you know, it's, it, the subject can be pretty lighthearted. Uh, it's not particularly intense. What you find, like all disciplines that for many of you guys are only gonna do once, um, I believe you have to do a tax module as well. Tax for, um, we're possibly here, if you're doing it here with Van Lee. I don't know if you've had the lectures for that already. Um, and I believe you have to do a law of business organization subject, essentially a company law subject as well. I think those are the three key law subjects, the subject areas you have to do. Um, and so this one you probably find is the lightest in that I'm not teaching you guys to be lawyers. In fact, quite the opposite. All, if I do my job properly, 
all I want you guys to do is to be able to recognize situations where, oh no, we're in some trouble. We need to actually go and seek, pay some dollars and to do that. And particularly for those doing things like uh, strategic and management accounting, um, costing it. Hey, we've got this particular problem. I don't know the ins and outs and the particulars of it. That's for the legal guys. But how much we're going to go and do some sort of budget to work out what we're going to have to do here. Um, it can be very helpful to know that stuff from, from a, a bit of a high level uh, perspective. So this class is, uh, oh, I've got a little roll here as well. Now, if your name's on the roll, that's fine. Just write it on the bottom and then, and then tick it away. Uh, I follow a pretty basic rule in terms of, uh, of attendance. Attendance is not mandatory for, for these, these subjects. Um, you are, of course, welcome. Um, particularly, is anybody here external? Any externals that are here? A couple around? Just, just the one. Um, and for any of the externals listening on the stream, uh, the, the, anybody that's within the vicinity of the Douglas campus is more than welcome to turn up uh, and to, to go and have a little listen. Like I said, it's, it's pretty light um, in terms of the material, but uh, I'm hoping by the end of it, yeah, you guys will pick up bits and pieces here and there. Um, so this particular lecture is also a bit short. So we're going to spend a bit of a time just, just going around the room, just get each person if that's all right. It's always a little bit of a one of those moments where you've got to talk about yourself uh, just ever so briefly. Um, and so we'll go around the room and just talk about things. What in particular, uh, I think from your guys' perspective, is to talk about how this sits in terms of your professional life. If you're a student and you've studied to, to be a student, um, about things that you might want to go into, or if you're studying this as part of your, um, uh, if you're already involved in organizations and this is, forms a, an integral part of it, or something you're doing for fun, um, you, you guys can talk about that as well. Um, so should we start down the very back? Gentlemen down the back, what was your name, sir? Justice? Yep. Hi. Uh, the yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> uh, uh, from Kenya. Kenya, yep. 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 Oh, very good. Oh, very good. Um, Last year, I had actually one of the top students last year was, uh, was Kenyan. Um, one of the nice things you guys will find in terms of your own background is the comparative law. You will spend a lot of time on doing this, if, for those that are um, international students, comparing it back to how and where the legal systems operate at home. There's going to be some areas of you know, strong similarities and some there'll be quite different ones as well. But um, thank you for that. Hi. Eric. Hi, Eric. I'm from Kenya. You're Kenya as well, yeah. 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 So you're based in Wales, sorry? Yes. Okay, nice. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough too, guys. Over. Uh, Abdullah. Nice. Okay, nice. Fair enough. So that's three. That's, I guess, then counting me, that's four people, three countries. I think last year there was 15 from 15 people and 13 countries. So it's, uh, you find that the, the, the this is about par for the course. Down, down the back. Jane. Hi, Jane. PNG, yeah. Oh, nice. Did you do your undergrad here or in Mosby? Oh, no, okay. Oh, no worries. Um, uh, the, we find in the, I, I teach the undergrad law subjects as well. And uh, we, every year we, there's always, there's a handful of PNG students for um, uh, very, uh, very disparate group. Some sometimes coming from, some of them I've met have come from more money, to be honest. And some of them have, you know, have come from the, you know, having to work real hard to 
get whatever sort of um, scholarships. The PNG, you guys are probably aware, has a sort of a special relationship with Australia and the you know used to be connected. And so the one thing about the the PNG, the legal system is fascinating because for a whole host of reasons. But the criminal law, uh, the code is the same as we use in Queensland, in Western Australia, PNG, Queensland, Western Australia, and Nigeria. It's four, four places, Griffith Code. So the, the criminal law is very, very similar between those countries for some quirky reason. It's, yeah, global history is a funny old thing. Okay, down here, hi. I'm Hi, Nimi. Yeah. Okay, and what leads you to the MBA? Yeah. I want to, I want to be a CPA. CPA, sure. So I'm doing my MBA in the US. Nice. Is there, now, forgive my ignorance in this. Again, I'm a Kiwi, so I did all the things over there. The, the the distinction between a CA and a CPA are they two different organisations, or what's the what's the sort of difference between those in here? I'm considering or writing my main difference because I was a CPA, ICA. Yeah. CPA. Yeah. Yeah, that's four, five, ten here, and in India back, we just have one. Yeah, sure. They, that's it. The New Zealand is the same. I've never. I, I suspect that there was some, and it's somebody else may be able to illuminate this. I suspect there was some sort of infighting, and there might have been two two organisations. Anybody that's done any, had any involvement with pretty much any, um, you know, non for profit organisation, in any sort of context, you'll find that they, they end up. Bickering. We do it better and we do it better. And it's kind of like business, but no one's being paid. It's, it's a bit strange. Hi. I am Laura Sisko. I am from India. India as well, yeah. I have done my um, master's in commerce from mm -hmm. and now I will make my MBA in business. And I have been working in the oh, nice. business. Your, um, your master of commerce, what area was that in? Was that in accounting or was that in economics or what? what? In marketing. In marketing. Okay, cool. It's, um, I found that the... The, the, I, I did business management as one of, and that was its own little area when I did the undergrad. Um, but you'd find that different areas would sort of pop out of it. So, you know, one year then they'd set up a separate marketing department or an international business and tourism. Tourism wasn't even a discipline. And I'm from New Zealand, it's like this tourist country. It wasn't even a discipline when I, I did that in the 80s. Whereas here, it's one of the biggest, uh, one of the, biggest areas of uh, the business school here. Apparently most of the PhD, probably about half the PhD students in this building. I didn't, uh, are in that area too. It's, um, it's really interesting. It's, uh, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Jakshar Singh. I'm from India as well. Yeah. Uh, I did my bachelor's in aerospace engineering. Uh, I worked in the engineering for a couple of years. Mm. And then I transferred to nice. technology. So I'm here to do my MBA in today. Oh, fair enough. Good job. I should have asked you guys, what state, by the way, are you guys reach from? Sorry? I'm from down south Kerala. Oh, yeah, Kerala. I'm, I'm from Punjab. Punjab, okay. I'm from I don't know where that is. <laughs> I know these two. I know these two. Where is where's your for sure? Okay. I don't I'm gonna I'm gonna smile sweetly. <laughs> like whereabouts is that then there? Uh, it's basically uh, the city of Kolkata. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, sorry, right, sorry. I confess my ignorance and such things. <laughs> yeah, um, Charlie, I'm also from Kerala, India. Okay, Kerala. And uh, yeah. I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Yeah. And then I switched to sales. Oh right. Yeah, yeah, as you do, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like life got in the way. Yeah, kind of. So uh, I got five years of experience, and then I decided that's kind of my career was going to be stagnant. Yeah, yeah, sure. And leadership would probably sort that out for me. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, good job. Um, it, that's actually pretty, um, a pretty common thing. You find that historically, the, M the MBA, I don't think the MBA more than the MPA, the MBA was, was classically something that was set up for people in organisations, but it was the requirement to go to the next step. Um, often it's not quite so true these days because of, um, like in Australia, for example, they, when I was a young fella, about 17% of people would have the equivalent of an undergraduate degree, and now it's double that. And so it's... Yeah. That's right, and that's right. And it was, what it was, was generally middle-aged people who'd, who'd worked up, you know, left school at 15 or whatever they could do back in the day, had worked in organisations for a long time, and then were told, look, if you want to move into you know, mid yeah. to senior management, you need to have art degree. And so that was the, the classic um, sort of combination. That I did that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's true. That's true. Like anything in life, you find it gets harder as we get older. Yeah. Just it's trickier. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Twenty. <laughs> I'm gonna smile sweetly at that. <laughs> Okay. Oh, nice. I'm about to 
Yeah, sure thing. Did you, did you do your bachelor's here or? No, no, no. I was going back to Mexico. Okay. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten people, four countries. Okay. It's a lower, it's a lower, lower average, yeah. <laughs> Kerala as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, so I'm semi-qualified, semi but then I uh, looked at Audit Manager and the CEO for procedures. Sure. And then I wanted to do consulting uh, with my CEO. So yeah, nice. Yeah, nice, fair enough. It's, um, it's, look, it's not, oh, well born, it's not for a rain. You guys probably, it's not a chore living in here. The city, it's a bit too hot this time of year, but uh, I've, I've lived here for 12 years. I'm not sure if you guys, you know, relatively recent, but um, it's, the city's it's pretty livable um if you don't mind the fact that there's you've got to literally fly somewhere before you get to anywhere that's the thing that drives me crazy about the city the um again as kiwi there's no direct flights to new zealand the only time there ever was some accidentally direct flight was and i saw this on the townsville bulletin one day and it had the new zealand prime minister drinking a beer at the brewery and i'm like how did this happen turns out our Prime Minister and Brendan McCullum were going to India on a trade thing and the plane broke down. So that's the only time they've actually flown to, directly to here. I was real sad. And I was at the brewery the previous day and the day after. I was so gay. I could have gone and had a beer with the Prime Minister. So sad. Let's see. Hi. Hi. Um, my name's Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Um, I'm from Australia, so not so exquisite. <laughs> um, I'm from Sydney, but I have a Sydney accent. Um, so I did a Bachelor of Commerce in Cairns with this first year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, the goal is to work um, up to maybe a CFO. Yeah, um, nice. That's the, that's yeah, the sure. plan. Um, I started working in a, an accounting firm, um, then uh, discovered a whole another area of accounting and worked in a, um, a local um, bank in or financial petitioning council, Queensland country. Nice. So the union in the finance department. Yep. Um, and it was like a whole world of non-tax related accounting and I'm like, wow. Um, so worked for Queensland Country, then uh, worked for Town City Council um, and currently working in a not-for-profit organisation in the health industry. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, that's really good. You've been in and around all sorts of places. One thing, um, again, and particularly the, the distinction you'll find, I come from New Zealand, obviously, which is kind of like a poor version of this country. Um, the one thing that you guys come, you know, particularly from you guys from the subcontinent, from Bangladesh and from, um, from India, the, the, the opportunities that we have here to pick and choose things. It's one of the hardest things. One of my good friends here is from, um, she's from Jaipur and she ended up being left as a single mum in her mid forties. And I was trying to explain to her that now she's here, she's got her visas and everything sorted. What do you do with your life? And it's something that's that you know we've had in, in our lives is that we have had these opportunities, wonderful opportunities to be able to pick and go and choose these things. And I think for, for you guys that have come to Australia, you know, hopefully you hang around for a bit, that are the opportunities to go and choose what you want to do with life is one of the awesome things about this country. I have noted myself. And oh, there you go, going and working in all sorts of places. So governments, private and in not for profits. You've done all done them all. There you go. Good job. Hi. Yep. Which state was? Uh, in Delhi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Sure. Did you do economics over in Delhi or, or here? Okay. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. The other thing that you'll notice too, when coming to um, these sorts of institutions, this room is only. This is amazing. This room is even half full, and you you find that when you guys did your undergrad, I gather that your classrooms weren't half. Uh, half full when situations where things are a lot more competitive and there's a lot more people um, competing for things you know the spaces are tight remember um, friends of mine describing to me in um, uh, going to university in China it being uh, what we would call the equivalent of short loan library books you couldn't just get a library book out of the library for three weeks no 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 no. you get it out and you get it for two hours and if you get it back because if if everybody took the you'd have no library left and that's the it's one of the things that's difficult culturally You'll find that the, the relationship between, in terms of the number of people and the, the space, the personal space, um, as well as population density, uh, you know, these things take a bit of getting used to, eh? 
um, the government to grips with that. Justin, Justin hi. Yep. Uh, Okay, nice. Um, which whereabouts are then? Yeah, whereabouts? Which state? You're, it's in Gujarat. Oh, in Gujarat. Oh, okay. My best friend's actually Gujarati. She, um, uh, yeah, she. Uh, what did she describe me as? Uh, something and something lost soul, atma something. I don't really remember like that. But um, it's um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's from. It's from. It's from there. From what I, I, I. From what I believe. I don't know. I read Wikipedia. Um, hi. Gary, I'm yeah. Australian. Yep. Um, well, I've been living in the US for the last 20 years. Alright. Uh, doing construction management. Oh, well, cool. Yeah, nice. And uh, just recently moved back and uh, close to my 20 year engineer. Yeah, nice. Okay. So you're an, an engineer by trade or what? No, it's, a very, no, so. it's, uh, it's more uh, design. Oh, nice. Oh, very cool. Design construction. Right. Um, and, uh, and oh, good job. Good job. It's just one curious thing I've noticed about design as a discipline that it used to be something that was you know, pretty much restricted to the architecture type type things yeah. where you go and you're thinking about better ways of doing buildings. These days, though, design as a phenomena, as an area, as a discipline, is now something that people can go and do and apply those sort of strategies almost well, to a whole variety of things. It's everything from yeah, engineering to art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Design thing. Um, uh, game designing. Is a, is a big thing, not the actual the hacking and coding and physics and things, but actually come, stepping back and thinking about how can we do things better? Things that you know, historically you've seen, the architects and the engineers were the ones who did that. But we reached a stage now where it's pervaded other areas. So we find it in law and for you guys in, um, in the accounting sphere as well, thinking about better ways and better, uh, doing things and, and uh, really changing and adapting the systems that you're going and dealing with. It's, uh, it's really, really neat. Design's really neat. Hi. Lucky last. My name is Emma, and I'm from Australia. Um, and I've worked in Denmark for eight years now, and I'm studying the engineering degree. Right, then. great. Cool. And so you're still working over this, over this way? You can just walk across? The, no, 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 don't walk. Don't walk across. Um, as you, most of you guys discover, you're walking in, in this, after about oh, 40 meters, you're just drenched. This is horrible. Um, I remember asking a friend of mine just before I started law. I've been at JCU for, uh, I think, in fact, I bounded up to the lovely Rachel Bradshaw, who's still here teaching. And I said to her, guess, who, guess what happened 10 years ago this week? And I bounded into her lecture. And again, this is me coming back to university for like the third or fourth time. Um, so I've been here for 10 years in law school, but I've been teaching for eight. Um, so I've been doing this quite a while. Uh, this subject, I've only taught the MBA version twice. Oh, well, twice including this, I did it last year and this year. So most of the teaching materials is, uh, that you'll see in there are, are mine. And, but the undergraduate subject, for the equivalent, you guys, most of you guys would have done with your accounting degrees or business degrees. Um, I've taught that for about three or four years. Um, so that's, uh, that's where I'm at for that. All right, shall we kick on? Shall we kick on, get on with this? This particular um, Lecture, by the way, it, it is going to be short. We're not we're definitely not going to go three hours, but generally it's going to be me talking. What the whole purpose of these these seminars is for you guys to interact. It's not really quite so much a lecture. I've created screencasts so that if you do want to, either before or during, or after or during, if you're really keen, you can jump on YouTube and you'll find. If you just type in CO five one one nine in that channel, you can uh, get a screencast. So I'm going through the same material just in a sort of structured short succinct way um, here th these things turn into a bit more a bit more of a dialogue so feel free to like jump in and uh, just a small favor that I ask is that if anybody pops up on the chat um, anybody feel free first of all if they're asking a question to answer it if you on your laptop and you happen to be on that as well um, that would be ice or just uh, just yeah put your hand up we'll interrupt and we have a little bit of a yarn and see if we can talk about um, answering questions there okay does anyone have any questions before we start we kick it off. Um, and uh, again, I apologize for uh, <laughs> the way that these things work with the um, lecture slides because it's, there's a delay every time. So I can click that now and that won't update for about seven or eight seconds. So I'm trying to get better at clicking it before I've finished, but we'll see how we go uh, with that. So anyway, we're going to be talking about law and we're going to be also talking about 
throughout this. I'm going to um, really weave the stuff that we need to know from the subject outline into the lecture itself. Um, historically, I'd gone and talked, gone through the subject outline depth, and usually everyone's bored as. I don't think it's going to require that level of depth, and I'll talk about particularly the first piece of assessment, which is related to the material from today. Um, but it's really this first week is talking about law in the broad sense. So not thinking about so much of the Australian or the Queensland legal system. Um, we're thinking about law as a phenomena. How does this work? What's the, um, what is law? What's good law? And those are not the same two questions. Um, how and where law comes from in different areas. And again, how it comes from in our system uh, and in, in other systems around the world. Uh, what sovereignty is in terms of, the, I guess, the ultimate power that law flows or derives from. Um, talk a little bit about uh, administration and then talk about the way the courts work, um, how the, the court system work um, here and elsewhere, and the legal profession. Uh, and some talk about some of their trials and, and tribulations. And so the thing is about this, this area and this, um, this particular topic is that it's largely ground, uh, grounded in philosophy. Uh, philosophy is, as you guys wear, that sort of study from things from absolute basic first principles. When talking about what is law, there really aren't right or wrong answers here. When we're trying to think about what, what, what and how we describe a legal system to be, what, we, what and how we identify a particular phenomena in the world to be a law, because you know, fundamentally, laws are really to do with the relationships between people. And one of the things you'll hear me talk about, uh, it's a little bit nasty when I say it, there's a bit of real politics, there's a bit of nastiness, because it's to do with the power dynamics that we have between each other. In terms of, I mean, if we think about it, just as an example, um, we know, most of us, that you can't just walk in here with a knife and stab someone. Well, we, most of us don't know exactly how and why that is and exactly what's going to happen, but we've got a vague idea that's not a good thing to do. It's not generally nice to stab people. There may be some circumstances where that may be an appropriate response. Say, I don't know, somebody's got a gun and you've got a, you've got a knife and you're sticking up behind them and you stab them. You know, there's some sort of excuses or whatever involved in that. But while we don't necessarily know the minutiae of it, we know that these, you know, this thing as a social phenomena exists. We know that there are these rules in place and we know that we can recognize them individually and i think importantly other people can recognize them as well it's that that mutual recognition um and there is a uh, or was an, uh, an english philosopher called h l a hart who um really turned legal philosophy on its head in the 20th century by saying that it's not really about mapping out what laws to try and identify what laws are. It's really about this idea of recognition. It's what other people think a law is. That that is fundamentally um, how we ground our, our understanding of this area for that. So there's a, a handful of definitions you get, and um, some of them, Steve, you're all, oh, stop. first bit of subject related material. Has anyone had a chance to have a look at through this book? This is an older version, I think it's the sixth edition. This is edition. Um, uh, Stephen, uh, now, this, you'll, you'll notice the way these sorts of textbooks work. They're usually, in most um, areas have this as well, they're usually written by 10 people. So you've got multiple people writing it in different areas. And the names on the front are usually in order of seniority. And what you find is that when somebody retires and don't want to do it anymore, the next person's name pops up. So that if you, and this is the sixth edition, so the name on the front of this is Mr. Pentany. And the... Eighth edition, I believe, was the prescribed text for this course. Now is um, is Professor Stephen Graw, Colonel Stephen Graw, who's my actually my PhD supervisor. So the changes that are, that are, for his area that have gone into this book, he got me to do some of them, or rather, he got me to check over them, um, which I'm always grateful to be paid. Um, and so Stephen Graw, who was the professor of law and head of school here for many years, um, is an expert on uh, tax, governance, and contract law, um, and he created this subject. So I'm sort of carrying on, I'll politely say carrying on that baton. Um, and it's a very readable book. You'll find it in terms of plain English explanation of things. Steve is an army guy. It's a professor of law and an army guy. 
And so it is the sort of, it's, you know, it's presented like a book that you would give somebody, read, hey, this is the law, here you go, go to it. And so there's not a lot of this stuff when we're talking about this philosophical background to it. There's not really a lot of that. It's a bit more of a no-nonsense gentleman as, uh, as Professor Graw. Um, and so, however, one thing that I have found in this particular subject over the years, and I've talked both in this and the undergrad, is this horrible, horrible feeling that I get, particularly when students haven't engaged with the material and they rock up to the final exam and they're starting to talk about the problem scenarios that are presented and they're using examples about fairness, and justice, and ethics, and this is wrong, and this is this. And the trouble is, that's not law. And so the, the first thing that I, I have to ask you guys to do, and again, most of you guys have done this in the undergrad anyway, but certainly from the master's level, and you'll be doing it for your first piece of assessment, is to set aside the knowledge that you currently have of law and do it as a thought experiment answering the problem based on morality. You've got to pick two frameworks as well. Have, have you guys had a chance to have a read? Um, I posted up on LearnJCU. As I said, I, I'll explain it in a little bit as well. But the idea is that in order to determine and try and map out what the legal rules that we're going to be learning are, it's helpful to be able to um, identify them as being separate and distinct, often from our own concept of morality, and sometimes other people's. Sometimes it could be helpful to do an analysis as a postmodern feminist of uh, you know, how and what this particular scenario would be, or to use a, a Greens philosophy to do it, or a Marxist philosophy to do it, or to use you know, this Australian concept of the fair go, or mateship, or um, things that flow from faith things that flow from, uh, from Hinduism or Islam or um, the Judeo-Christian or um, traditions or Taoist or what hell have you. What I want you guys to do for that task, it's not very long, it's 500 words, but go through the scenario, which is just a simple buying and selling. And when we do contract law, which is the bulk of the subject, we'll go through and learn the proper rules for it, the actual laws, but I don't want you guys to do that yet. I want you guys just to have a go with your own thoughts of you know, what either your own personal morality, or if you're not comfortable doing that, um, pick what you think, one of the religious frameworks or one of the other um, philosophical frameworks, might be libertarianism or um, anarchists, people that don't like government and rules at all. And so that's, a, that's uh, for you guys, it's, a, it's, it's really set up to be a thought experiment. It's not set up to be a substantive testing of your knowledge. Because to be honest, I'm literally not asking for any knowledge of law as part of their assessment. Now, if anybody else happens to have read it, you'll also notice that there's a double chance. Mention that somewhere in that thing there. I'm going to just explain that now. I couldn't really put it in the subject outline, but I can explain it to you here. Basically, um, you've got two weeks to do that assignment. Okay, two weeks, two weeks to do 500 words. You, you're probably going to be all right. But at the, um, uh, at the end of the semester... So particularly the, in doing the exams, most of you guys are internal students. You may note in our subject outline that we actually do the exam for the subject is in SWAT fact week. It's, it's a week before the formal exam period. So just have a little note, go through the subject outline, particularly for those that have to go away in certain points and periods of time. Just note that that's when the exam period for this. And look, if you are going to have dramas in meeting and having the exam at that particular time, contact me now. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend in a class of this size, that you guys email me all the time. Build a dialogue, build a relationship with the staff. And it's something that we encourage certainly amongst the law students, admittedly, teaching an administrative law where I'm encouraging them to come and twist my arm in order to get the best grade possible. But hey, if you guys do that, that's great. This is a subject grounded in law. There are rules I have to follow. I don't have arbitrary power to pick whatever grade I feel like and give it to you guys. There's a piece of legislation that's been properly passed through the Queensland Parliament called the James Cook University Act, and it prescribes some rules, and those rules say the council can make little policies. Those policies says each subject must have a subject outline, and I'm obliged to follow it. So that, these are things that you guys should be thinking about. This is a law subject. If you've managed to find a loophole somewhere, good work. Good work, I'd be stoked. I'd be absolutely right. Um, 
And so that, that's something I, I do want you guys to think. It's trying to think about law in the broad sense, but also try to get the best grade you possibly can. And one of the ways you can do that is building a dialogue now. So send me an email. Hey, I didn't understand this. Come and see me. My, I have a formal office hour where I am obliged to be there, which is 10 till 11 on Wednesdays, upstairs in room uh, 205. It's a little cubicle hell. Right, if you just barge in there, there'll be somebody who point, point you in the right direction. Um, but I'm, a, I'm usually here. This semester, I have a relatively large amount of time during the day. So if you guys are free during the day, I can. Does anybody work in or, or near the city? The city, the city campus, a little bit? Not like that. Okay, no, that's fine. It's, um, if need be, I can go and meet you guys in the city campus as well. Um, if I don't know, I think obviously a little bit of, a little bit in advance. Um, that's fine. Free to, free to travel on that. So, again, build a dialogue. Send me an email. Got any question? Send an email. If you've got time, come and visit. Um, what I find though is the tricky thing about this subject, and you'll notice that the times got changed to six till nine, only quite late in the piece. If anybody's trying to enroll last year, the subject, some, mm, somebody had booked this class to be taught on Wednesday afternoon at like one till four or something like that. Most of you guys have jobs. Most of you guys have work. You've got other things on and busy lives, and I accept that. And so I said, I'm, I'm flexible. Sending email is often the best thing to do, or you can call me. I think I've sent you guys out my um, number up here. If you want my mobile number, that's fine. You call me any anytime you need to. Um, with if you're having difficulty with aspects of the subject, uh, the trick, the really important trick, is to contact the staff early. That's really the key part. And one of the nice things. We're all, we're all most, almost all the law staff are actual lawyers. I, mean, I have a little practicing certificate somewhere. Um, we know all about following rules. We know we're obliged to follow rules. And one of the key things is, if you're ever doing a law subject, if you complete all of the paperwork, the university's paperwork, that says you're ill or you've got a reasonable excuse and this, that, and the other thing, I, I can't override that. I don't have the power to. You can twist, my, twist our arms. Know what, learning how those systems work. So just leave that in the back of your mind. But the key thing, and this is something that we tell all the law grads as well, get onto it early. Um, when timelines, because sometimes the time frames can be strict on things. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions about that so far? In terms of the subject, like I said I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the the remainder of this. If you're again for those that have read the subject outline, we've got the um, ten percent reflection piece, which involves talking about these things and they pop up on the screen um, and you don't need a lot of prior knowledge in order to do that and we'll be talking about the project-based task uh, I'll, I'll go through that next week there's a series of things we have to do for that but I'll talk about it and I'll leave that till next week um, there is a test as well an online test um, I believe it's on the 18th or 19th of April on a Friday um, it's open for a day you just got to pick a spot at some stage to do that test. I think it's 40 minutes. Um, for those, has anybody here actually done the undergraduate business law subject with Neil Dunbar at JCU? I don't know, possibly no one has. Okay, the test is very similar to that. Unfortunately, it has to be a bit harder um, because this is um, Australian Qualifications Framework. There's a rating from one to 10. Everyone, you've seen that you have things like Cert 1, Cert 2, Cert 3, Cert 4. Um, an undergraduate degree is a seven out of ten. This is at a nine. So the material has to be harder. Okay, so that if you're going and you're looking, use this, the same textbook, but it's assessed. You guys, the standards you guys are expected to have and to know and understand is just higher than the undergrads, and you're graded accordingly. Um, I've never done an online test. Yeah. Um, is it how does it work with an so like an open book? Yeah. Ah, oh, one thing. It's one of those wonderful things about law subjects. I don't know why, no one else in the university does this. Law historically has open book exams. So your exam will be open book, and the test is open book. And that sounds really easy until you go to do an open book exam. Oh, I've got to tell you a funny story. No, it's not really that funny. Uh, back in 1994, I did legal studies in high school, my second to last year of high school. New Zealanders are a bit dumb, we have 13 years of school. Um, and so I said, and I did legal studies. And I remember in our open, first open book exam ever, I was so happy. And the question was, um, describe the elements of murder. And so I went to my, opened up my notes, opened up to my page, and it had the word murder written in it. Murder, underline. 
and then two blank pages. And I fill in rest for homework was written in brackets. And it was two blank pages. And I'm like, yeah, open book exams. They're, a, they're, a, they're their own thing. Um, the, there's ups and downs of doing open book. The, the test is open book. The exam is open book. You can bring in anything you like. Except library books. That's just a policy reason. Not allowed to bring library. Otherwise, there's only one copy of the book and it wouldn't be fair and yada yada. Um, what that means is that it completely changes the dynamic of how you prepare. Uh, for most of you guys, I gather most people in the room have only done closed book exams, uh, probably up, maybe at all. Has anybody ever done open book exams? Done one, two, a couple? Yeah. Oh, the CPA, oh, of course, yeah, it is. It's like, is it the CPA exam? They're like six hours, aren't they? Something ridiculous. Three hour exams, Three hour exams. okay. I remember my, my friends across the Tasman doing their final professional exams, and it was like a day. Each of them was, yeah, they were six hours and just writing. So one of the downsides of these long open book exams, your hand gets real sore, um, it can be. What I have found, I have very slow handwriting, so I'm very sympathetic to that. So I generally find the exams that I write, and I'll write them for this one, are usually a little bit more succinct. I don't really like giving people a competitive advantage from being able to write lots, because there's, there's actually some quirky JC policy rules that if you write something correct and then you write something incorrect, we actually have to give you a mark. Don't ask me, I didn't make this policy. Some quirky, quirky rules in terms of doing that. So we can't mark destructively. You can't have... You get 100% and then you lose a mark for every, every wrong thing you say. We're, not, we're just we're forbidden from doing a whole host of these things. So yeah, if you carefully read the JCU teaching policy, you might be able to get me on that one. Um, when I do the exams, I generally make them a little bit more succinct. But what that means is that you're going to be, have to be a bit more on your toes in terms of answering the questions. So it's the, you, have, you have to know the stuff, really. That having all the notes in the world doesn't... Sadly, having all the notes in the world doesn't matter when you open the book and start arguing in terms of faith and common sense and fairness and whatever else is on the screen when you need to talk about the rules of contract law or tort or agency and so on. Um, I believe it's a two-hour exam, final exam, and I said it's just the key thing to note is that it's in swap back for the internal students. It's in the regular exam period for the external students. You can change that. Yes, you can. You can. Send me an email. So if you do, and again, if you guys, if anybody doing the internal can't make that particular week, get in touch with me now and we'll switch you over to the external. You still come to class and just do, there's no difference in the subjects. Um, but in this, in, if you can't make that particular week or if you're in the external and you want to do it earlier, you're welcome to switch that over as well and I'll, um, I'll take care of that. But just send me an email. Okay. So I'm just trying to talk about what law is. Uh, start with what's not law. Those things are not law. Um, we have, all of us as human beings, have our own concept of what's fair, what's right, what's moral, what's ethical. Um, and these things come from a culture where we've, we've been brought up, from our national identity, from our family, from our parents, from the social institutions we're engaged with, from our friends and peer groups. Anybody here got kids? Kids? I've got a little little guy and tell you what peer group makes a big difference in terms of in terms of children in terms of their upbringing the literature is overwhelming in terms of that um, ethics by the way is a branch of philosophy where these things that they try to derive these principles from well, I guess from the absolute basic rules that we have in, in the universe these universal what is it derived from first principles that's what ethics is supposed to be out it's a structured branch of philosophy um, and it's supposed to be independent of the religious one a lot of the the beliefs in terms of fairness and justice and so on flow from uh, faith the faith-based systems we have and again I'm interested if you guys do want to talk about that in your reflective piece it's definitely worthwhile if you know you know one or two particular faiths to be able to talk about that talk about those systems when you're talking about um, when you're answering that particular problem uh, scenario Common sense. Do you ever know where that phrase came from? I, I found this out just the other day. It was um, it's the American Revolution. It was a philosopher by the name of Thomas Paine who distributed all of these pamphlets to everyone saying that we should fight against the British. I mean, let's, let's face it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, fighting against the British seems to be a pretty common thing, a pretty common theme in the last 200 years. 
But in that particular case, in the American Revolution, these pamphlets, he said that fighting against the British um, and re- uh, getting back our freedom and is something that we ought to do. And that pamphlet was called Common Sense. There we go. So that's how that, that phrase come from. Because that's, so, so Common Sense is fighting against the British. <laughs> Good job. I'll, um, I do go, I, it's something that in terms of uh, world and global history and the history particularly of, of contract law, um, I will be talking about the bad things and the occasional good things uh, to do with the British Empire. And it's always one of those things really interesting in these sorts of classes when um, people from you know, most of these uh, countries, I think everybody here are all experts. I think Bangladesh was, I'm not sure what the, how the status was. Hey, that was partitioned, wasn't it? That was, that was East Pakistan. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so the, the, the various systems that have flowed from that um, are uh, just they're interesting to see, but you can't analyze them without going into history. Uh, there. So uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's difficult for me as a. I mean, I'm a. Uh, we use the term uh, term Pakia, which is Maori word to describe Caucasian, European descended New Zealanders. Um, but it's I found coming to Australia. And looking at the Australian legal system, teaching the Australian legal system, I had to do the citizenship ceremony. It took me 60 seconds to do the, you've got to do a test. Has anybody ever done the citizenship test? Has anybody done that? Or planning to do it at some stage? Yeah, you, you, you've got to do a test, a little, little test. It's, uh, in fact, I'm going to challenge one of these. How many colours are there on the Torres Strait straight flag? Three. Three? Well, there are. Green, blue, and black. And black. That's oh. four. Four. That's a oh, one mark off. Got to get eighty percent, mate. That's um, and so it's. I mean, I my accent's wrecked. Uh, I mean, you, 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 you guys. Do I sound Australian or, or Kiwi to you guys? It's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. Okay. Mm, yeah. Say the number six. I don't like saying it. It sounds. A, it's a lewd word. I'm not allowed to say that word while I'm being recorded on because YouTube will ping me. Um, yeah, and so the, but the analysis of history is really important. When you're learning law, you're learning about contract law. I will talk about the history of the British Empire for ill and for uh, for good and for ill. Um, so if, if anybody wants to take a piece out of me from that, you're well, more than welcome to. But uh, I, I've been teaching it for quite a long time, and it's look, it's important to know. Um, I think it's an important area of history in terms of world history, and I, I will be talking about that in a bit of depth over the next, or just the next two weeks. All right, but this key thing to note, this stuff is not law itself. That's the one takeaway that I have for that. Okay. Now, all right, so when we're thinking about law, some philosophical frameworks, and this is the one that I've taken from this textbook, try to paraphrase this in terms of when we're looking about law from what we call a teleological perspective which is really looking at you know what is it if we're looking at this externally um, how does this thing fit together if we're looking at it from an arm's length perspective when we're stepping back and trying to work out okay there is this thing we'll assume that law exists assume that it exists so make that assumption first what does it do? Um, so some ideas that some philosophers or groups of philosophers loosely um, say that the purpose of law is to maintain some sort of order. If you don't have law, everything descends into anarchy and chaos. Um, there's a, a, a British philosopher by a guy by the name of Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes wrote his, famous, his single most famous uh, work called The Leviathan. And I will refer to this a few times um, in the rest of this lecture, actually. Um, the Leviathan was, is this famous piece of philosophy that he wrote during the Civil War talking about sovereignty. And what he reckoned is that you need to give it away. You need to give away your personal sovereignty, the ability for you to do whatever the hell you like in life. You need to give that power away to a higher power, which we call the sovereign. Because if you don't, life is 
short, nasty, and brutish. That's the phrase that he used, which, of course, many philosophers have taken up to say short, nasty, and British. But really, that's what it is. If there was no higher power, we would play, and this is his famous line, we would play every card in our hand as though it were a trump card. Now, this particular phrase doesn't mean much. I find when I'm teaching the undergrads, they're like, what are you talking about? Isn't that the American president? I'm like, no. When I was a kid, we used to play card games, and then sometimes you would have one of the suits would end up being the trump suit, and those cards, you know, the hearts would then beat all of the other cards. That's what I mean by a trump. So you guys know what I'm talking about here. This is good, because it's when I'm talking to 18-year-old to Australians, they look at me funny. Anyway, that's what Hobbes' famous line was back in the 1600s. If we could choose, you know, who should get all the money? If we had the power to choose, just choose ourselves. Of course we would. We should choose, you know, who has to do all the work and who doesn't have to work? Well, that's a pretty easy, easy solution and so on and so on. We would do that. We'd play every card in our hand as though it were, were a trump. And so fundamentally, this idea of sovereignty is to give it away. We agreed, and this is what's called the social contract. And when I studied law or 10 years ago, we used to analyze social contracts. And the un I did philosophy degrees, pretty straightforward conceptually, if you've done that. But social contracts have nothing to do with legal contracts. And they were trying to mix and match the two, and it confused the heck out of the, young, out of the 18 year olds. So Hobbes' idea give your personal power away to one. Now, he thought, of course, the best form of sovereignty was to have a king. Seems a bit strange to us now. We think that it's like the antithesis of the decent society. But from his perspective, having one person in control was just way better than having no one in control. Anarchy was just, anarchy was worse than having one um, sole authoritarian power. Now, in recent times, uh, yeah, uh, no, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to authoritarianism a bit, a bit later. Um, that second point, though, balance the needs of the individual and the collective. What is the, the, the main mechanism we use to take things from some people and give them to other people? What do we call that? Uh, starts with T. Taxation. You guys will spend a whole semester with Van learning it. Taxation is the taking of stuff from one group to do other things, to benefit society as a whole. Tax is really important. I got to teach tax with Steve a few years ago. Love tax law. If you have any questions about tax law, you know, ask me, not during this class. I also have a whole bunch of recordings for anybody that's doing tax in that channel somewhere. I um, record all the sheets. But tax is really important. Um, and that is the primary mechanism to be able to fund pretty much everything that we do in, um, uh, in, this, in the society we live in. Uh, does anybody have any... Any counter argument? Does everybody think they pay too much tax? We're curious about this. Oh, yeah, I do. I do. do you really? <laughs> Rorting it. Oh. It's, um, it's interesting because I've found that the political display, and I'm interested in terms of for those, again, particularly from the subcontinent, whether the tax, is the level of tax an important political issue? Because it is in, in the US. It is not as much here. And it's hardly at all in New Zealand. I found it really weird. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested to see, and it's the sort of question I, you know, I'll probably you know, get to know all you guys at some stage, but to see whether or not that's the case. And PNG, is the tax, is the level of taxation problematic? Is it a social issue? Yeah, like, a lot of people are not talking about it. Like, they're talking about taxes, so they're talking about it. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Government needs more money, just tax, tax some more. Uh, so what about in Kenya, guys? What's the tax like there? Is it something, is it a social issue? Do people complain about it? Ah, uh, of course. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're trying to, they're trying to squeeze, yeah, as if there's people, yeah, you find they're trying to squeeze as much as they can. I went to um, Tonga uh, oh, a, few, a few years ago. Uh, yeah, and I, I definitely saw that. Now, you guys are aware um, uh, how the, the most guys heard of Transparency International, T, the TI, the TI rating in terms of different countries, in terms of where they come out. Now, one thing I've noticed culturally coming here, New Zealand is way, way less corrupt than Australia. It's noticeably different. And you guys may find this, you guys may find that a little bit strange, noticing between it, the relationship between money and 
politics here is much more you know, interwined and going and traveling a little bit more and traveling in other countries and you guys again coming from uh, Kenya's not too bad by African standards African standards in terms of the TI ratings uh, that's it's, it's a challenge it's, it's challenging and particularly as a business owner you find that too you're visible you're something the government sees and again when I was in Tonga they see this as well the government can see this hey look you're making money you need to give this and they keep doing it and they keep doing it and then eventually what happens you just like I don't want to do this anymore and that's that's you know, killing the, the golden egg Again, the, the economists amongst us are probably in a much better position to, uh, to do that. But um, Australia is very regulated. This doing things in this country and going back to this, the law and the legal system, doing anything. Is, has anybody here actually tried to set up a company in Australia? Anybody had to go through that rigmarole? Oh, first of all, it cost $500 to set up a company in Australia. $500 and I had to send the paperwork to Gippsland. Does anyone, do most people know in this room where Gippsland is? No, it's like way off in rural Victoria. I don't know why, there must be a branch of the company's office there. $500, you've got to pay $150 a year to, um, to manage it and you've got a huge amount of compliance and paperwork to fill in. It's, and then if you want to employ staff, yeah, yeah there's a lot, of, a lot of hoops to jump through, but that's the way the Australians decided that this is the good society. We want to have this, these regulations in place to um, essentially regulate and protect people. It's about creating the good society. Having these systems of law and regulation are there ostensibly to make society better. Um, and so it's that idea of stopping the individuals from being able to do whatever the heck we want. If I had the choice, I'd pay people $2 an hour, for example. But we don't. At minimum wages. Whether or not, again, for the business owners, whether it means that we just don't go and start businesses as a result, well, that's, that's something for the economists and the political debate uh, to, to come through and talk about. Okay, um, why don't we take a break here now, guys? Yeah, it's been about an hour. Do you guys just want to take a, should we take a, just a couple of minutes break? We'll go get some water. Um, the tap, there's a better drinks tap up there. Does anybody want coffee? I've got decaf or regular coffee and little machines. If, if anybody, I'm, I'm going upstairs. If anybody wants coffee, well, um, you can come and follow me up there. All right, let's do a little.
All right. Hopefully I'm a bit more audible now. Okay. All right. So moving from the, I guess, the high-level philosophical stuff into a little bit more tangible stuff. <laughs> Can I talk about jurisdiction? Now, the, the idea of sovereignty, and again, we'll talk about this in more depth in a very sort of concrete examples, but the, this key idea of if we, could, if we could be king, we would be king. We can't all be king. The social contract says we have to give away our personal sovereignty to a group or a body or an entity of some sort. They get to be king or government or whatever we want to call that particular thing, boss. Now, the key uh, point to take from this, though, is that us coming together to give our sovereignty away, that has limits. It has limits in terms of um, the territory, like the physical land to go through things, and also sometimes the subject matter. Now, Australia and India and PNG and the United States are all federal systems. Kenya, I actually don't know. Is Kenya federal or is it unicameral? Is it, does it have a, um, do you have uh, multiple divisions and then a separate federal government? It is, it's not federal. Okay, so it's like New Zealand, New Zealand and the United Kingdom and are, um, uh, they are not federal. They're, they're called um, unity, uni, uni, unitarian states. Yeah, two parliaments. Is Bangladesh, Bangladesh has got two? No, it's one, it's one as well. Okay, there you go. But PNG, I think, is, is federal, though, isn't it? Is it? I'm sure. Sorry, put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, I'll go and check that. A good friend of mine's from, from Manus. She'll, she'll, mm. She's a law student. Surely she'll know. Um, but this idea of your jurisdiction can exist geographically. So we think of Australia. And I've always found it very funny as a Kiwi, uh, reading the New Zealand Herald when they talk about Australia. Oh, the Australian Criminal Code says this, and this woman rocks up to court in New South Wales and the Australian code this. I'm like, no, 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 no. Silly, silly Kiwis. What they meant to say was the New South Wales system does this, this, and this. Now, this idea of jurisdiction um, applies geographically and it can apply, I guess, vertically in terms of having different levels of government. Um, we also will talk about it in relation to the court system here as well, in terms of the power that the various courts in Australia uh, in particular have. But when we're thinking about this difference between the nations and our jurisdiction that we have giving away our personal sovereignty, arguably when we're here, we're giving away our sovereignty, interestingly, to the state of Queensland, not the country of Australia. So there's the first bit of I don't know whether useful information, but again, the first piece of law that you've learned is that by default, all laws that you are subject to while you are in the state of Queensland are Queensland laws. So that is the first thing, the jurisdiction. And that flows from history because the state of Queensland, or then before that, the colony of Queensland, before that, the colony of New South Wales, um, were the, uh, um, how do we call it, the foundational points by which this idea of sovereignty is derived. Now, there's a few problems with this. What does the year 1788 mean to uh, the Australian and non-Australian people in this room? Go. <laughs> what happened in 1788? Any of you guys have any idea? Does that name ring a bell? Well, by the way, if you're doing the, your citizenship test, you will have to know what that date means. Did anybody else? Uh, at the back. No. No. What, what's the significance of 1788? You know the answer. You probably know the answer, but I don't know. Anybody else in the room? What happened? Is it? Someone there? Well, 1788, it wasn't a queen then. It would have been a king. Uh, but it... Uh, 1788 was the year of the what they call the first fleet first fleet sailed and arrived in botany bay new south wales and they got a flag out and they put the flag in and like, here's my here's the start of me slacking off the british empire and they put the flag in the ground and they said this is now ours and this idea of uh sovereignty 
in terms of who the sovereign, who is the entity that we've given the power to. At that point in time, British have come, planted their flag. This is now ours. In fact, my ex-wife teaches history uh, here at JCU and used to talk about global history and that the British had this nasty habit of just going around places, very, very good map makers. There's one thing, a lot of this, people say a lot of bad things about J Captain James Cook. He was really good at making maps. The British were very, very good cut at cartography. That's one thing you, for ill, for good or for ill, they were very good at doing it. So they would go around and make these very, very good maps, all right? And so you draw the coastline because they had really good boats. I'll go through and I've got a big spiel about British and their boats. Um, and then what they would do, they'd get a, a little red colouring in pencil, colour it in and say, this is now ours. So, you know, it didn't matter what it was, all of Australia, all of New Zealand, all of Africa, this is now ours. Now, the existing people that live there generally had something to say about this. Um, and it goes back to this idea of sovereignty. And it actually comes back uh, to a, a particular period in European history. Um, you guys, I don't know if you guys know your history of Europe very well, but they fought wars. Lots of wars. Like if you go and to Wikipedia or Google and just type list of wars in Europe, it goes for pages and pages and pages and pages and pages. And what happened was one particular series of wars, the, I think it was the 30 years war. So they all have different names. You've got the seven years war, the 30 years war, the hundred years war, lots of wars. One of them involved a whole bunch of countries. Spain, who thought they owned Holland, of course, how logical, um, had come to this particular arrangement with the Austrian empire and the French were doing this and the Swedes were doing something else and they had a, a whole bunch of series of wars for 30 years and at the end of it they're like oh can we just, just put this on hold for a bit all right and they, this was they had a, a treaty a particular peace treaty called the Treaty of Westphalia uh, which is a place I believe it's in Germany I'm not sure where Westphalia is these days in terms of the modern wars but they came together in the city and they signed a treaty now even though they didn't formally map this out at the time, the British, by the way, weren't involved in this. British and English at the time weren't involved for other reasons that I'll explain. But this was in the 1600s. Came together, had this peace treaty, and a lot of historians look back at that particular treaty and go, ah, this is the point in time where the nation state really started to exist. And they talk about this idea of the Westphalian model of sovereignty. And the key thing is, the, the real key takeaway here is that all of these different areas, the French, and the Belgians, the English, the Swedes, whatever, they don't like each other, right? They hate each other generally. They've been fighting wars for thousands of years. Of course they have. But the key thing that they come to recognize at that point is that even if we don't like each other, we recognize that you exist. We recognize that even though we don't like the French, we're happy to conquer the French, don't think it's gonna be that hard um the french exist and it sounds really dumb when i'm saying that like it's like an oxymoron but this idea of westphalian sovereignty is the idea that nation states exist and they are the highest power there is nothing supranational in the westphalian model of sovereignty there's no higher power beyond the nation state do we reckon this applies these days? In a broad sense. Do you reckon there are things these days that are higher than the nation state? Mm, arguably, the United Nations Security Council has sort of displaced the, the model because it turns out it didn't work. It didn't work. Two, two things that happened that really showed that the Westphalian model didn't work. And they are called World War I and World War II. And by the end of World War II, we're like, right, that's it. We're going to do this again. That is the end of the species. You know, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, this is it. If we're going to play the same games we've been playing in Europe for the last thousand years. It is the end of everything we know. And so it's a really important thing in terms of history, at point in time in 1945. And for those um, you know, students of history, and particularly the younger guys amongst us who are looking off into the future, the challenges to this, the 1945 model um, that are here in the world now are really scary. Right? Anybody that can remember the Cold War, 
um, you know, the, the challenges that are facing the world now uh, in places like the South China Sea, pay attention because it will matter. It may not seem like it's going to matter. It's going to matter. Anyway, why weren't the British fighting this? Well, it turns out the, well, the English they were. It was before Britain existed as a separate thing. Uh, they were having civil war. So they were fighting themselves at the time. So that's why they weren't part of the Westphalian thing. But we use this term Westphalian sovereignty, and I'll use it throughout this course to describe this idea that there is no high power. That's not to say that there weren't entities that you'd consider now to be supranational. Um, the VOC. Do you know what the VOC stands for? Students of history? It's the Dutch East India Company. Um, something that operated across borders. It was an entity in onto itself. Um, the Catholic Church is something that operated across borders. Um, a thing called the Holy Roman Empire was still, the fragments of that were still around when the Treaty of Westphalia was around. Um, you did have these entities, even in those days, that transcended what we would call national boundaries. But the historians gone back and said, that's really the point. I think it's 1648-ish where that started to happen. All right, so that's the first thing. No higher power than the nation state. Now, inside nation states, though, you can also chop things up in terms of responsibility. Now, I mentioned how everything originally in Queensland, because it flowed from the colony of New South Wales, and it was a colony in itself. It still reported to Mother Britain. So we would have a, a person, well, what's the name of the head of state who, has to, who reports to Britain? What's it called in, a, in the state of Queensland? In Queensland, what's known as the... And this, the Australian one is called the Governor General. The Queensland one is just called the Governor. So Queensland has Governor, which is the Queen's representative. Now, this is the Queen of Australia, by the way. Again, when I went to my little citizenship ceremony, and you had the, there's a full cardboard cutout of the Queen. Now, yes, it is the same person who's the Queen of England, and we're comfortable with that. Why? Because when you start giving your president powers when your head of state exec actually give them substantive powers to do things, problems happen. Just ask the Venezuelans. Just ask the Americans. What happens when you give your president powers to go through and do things? In particular, and again, you guys maybe, have you heard about this Donald Trump thing with the executive order to go and build his wall? This is the sort of stupidity that you know, the, 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 literally the American Revolution was fought to try and stop because they didn't want the King of England to be able to do that. And then they put in their own president and they did try to limit the presidential powers. But one of the key things, and this is a very important point, in times of crisis, we've got three arms of government, which I'll talk about later in this lecture. In times of crisis, only one of them matters. Usually it's the one that controls the army, by the way. Um, and that's, that's something to always leave on the back of your mind, that we have this well-regulated, structured, and decent society, but you know, when the proverbial SHIT hits the fan, the army, the, the real politic comes out, the actual ability to do that, and that is essentially the executive. Push the courts, push parliament aside. That's a bad way of running your, your country. Just ask the Russians. Okay. So something happened in the 1800s in Australia. Uh, and again, the world was in the grip of this great colonial race. Try and scoop up colonies from the 1700s, 1700s, so it's the 18th century and the 19th century. The, the major European powers, the British, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the uh, Germans, and the Russians. We're all going around the world trying to grab bits. Grab bits here and grab bits there. Some were better at doing it than others. Turns out the Italians weren't very good at doing anything, really. But, um, and the, each of them had their own little empires which rose and fall. Um, the, um, the, the thing, by the way, really kicked off in the year 1492. It's a long time ago now. long time ago now. You want to know what happened in the year 1492? Oh, this Magellan was that, yeah, that was that. It was well, Columbus was in, in 92, and then yeah, it wasn't long after they were like, Oh, we can make some money here, but it was, it was that it was the, the connection between the new world and the old world. 
Um, and that started, um, unfortunately, for the indigenous peoples of the Americas, um, I started a long, long, long period of quite miserable things. I think, what, 95% of the population of North and South America died over the next uh, however long. It was, it was a pretty, pretty sad, sad tale. But you know, studying the history of these things, this is, this is how, the, how the world came to be. Um, it's always difficult, by the way, teaching this stuff. This is the stuff, because it's, I, I'd be careful. I, and look, to be honest, I mean, I, they say that about um, you know, comedians and things, that you're pushing boundaries. You're always gonna be pushing boundaries. You know, it may, some of it may be uncomfortable to go through and do, but um, throughout this period of the colonial powers running around the globe, trying to grab up as much land as they possibly could, um, there were fears in Australia, which by now was a little collection of colonies, that they'd be invaded. Um, uh, the Japanese were rapidly modernizing their um, military, you know, starting to do that. In fact, you guys, I don't know if you're aware or not, but the Japanese went to war with Russia in 1905, and they won. So this was the first time an Asian nation had essentially defeated a European nation. And so that, there was very much this, um, this fear of the time that these little isolated you know, British colonies all over we're just going to get wiped out. Just Japanese are going to rock up with a decent army, a lot, bunch of boats, and just and just knock them off one at a time. So they wanted to create a, essentially a unified system to be able to to deal with that. Push the aircon. Is it all right to push the aircon? Sorry, um, Justice or somebody at the back. Is it all right to just push the aircon button? Because the yeah, annoyingly there's there's, there's there's the two buttons and the aircon. You don't notice it until you've until it's been off for a little bit. And you're like, ah. And so they did. And so they came together, had a, a series of Australian they're called constitutional conventions. And one of the interesting things about the Australian constitution, and the Indian one's interesting too, which I'll get to, is the Australian constitution's got some problems with it. A few problems. In fact, I taught a class, this is back in 2016, and it was the stage one introduction to law subject. And some of the smart asses, a real smart ass army guy, who says to me, oh, wouldn't it be really funny if like, you know, some MPs turned out to have foreign citizenship we were talking about that. There's the particular rule in the Australian constitution, you can only have citizenship to Australia. You can't owe allegiance to a foreign power. And I laughed, laughed at him and said, ah, oh, <laughs> yeah, that would be funny, but I can guarantee you the people in those political parties have carefully gone through and vetted all of their candidates. <laughs> Wrong. It was like 12 of them got disqualified. 12, might, might have even been more. Um, the Australian constitution says, you cannot have allegiance to a foreign power. Well, that essentially means you can't be a dual citizen. So you can't, if you do want to run for parliament, federal parliament in Australia, you can't be a dual citizen. And you better go and double check because if you've accidentally got citizenship because you had a grandfather in wherever, um, then yeah, it's tough luck. It's, it's a strict liability. Um, so, um, oh, they had these constitution debates and they came together, look, we need to create this federal system. And so they agreed, they actually invited New Zealand and we went to the first one and then we actually said, nah, this is not really for us. For better or for worse, probably for worse, certainly financially. Um, New Zealand, by the way, has about the same population as Queensland and Queensland has double the GDP. Yeah, it's a bit scary when you start to do those numbers. Australia's got a lot of stuff. Just knock over another hill. So, 1901. Does anyone know what happened in 1901 in Australia? Yeah, Australia happened. So the actual country of Australia existed from the 1st of January, 1901. Uh, no great fanfare, because to be honest, for the first 20 years, nothing really happened. It didn't really matter. The federal government, yeah, sure. They're responsible for the communications and the banking and a few other things. In fact, the whole purpose of the Australian constitution is that they got to look at the, what the Americans had done over a hundred years before. So we, we stopped to think about it. everything. In the, everything in the past is old. Everything in history is all at the same time. The Romans and pirates and um, you know, Queen Victoria, they're all old. No, there was a hundred years of looking at what the American constitution did good and what they did bad. And the Australians looked at that and said, we don't want the bad bits, we just want the good bits, thanks. And they got, they did a reasonable job. Still some problems, but a reasonably good job. Again, 
things like the citizenship debacle have come out in recent time. Now, um, one of the interesting things about the Australian Constitution, though, is that there is this strict separation. The federal government has power to do certain things, raise an army. The states no longer have that power. This is an exclusive power of the federal government. Only they can do it. Only they can deal with the banking system. Only they deal with corporations. Only they deal with the postal system, uh, disputes between states, interstate trade, foreign relations. There's a whole host of them. It's in section 51. Australian constitution, there's like 30. Now, other countries have looked at what the Australians did, and uh, again, for good or for ill, looked at it and said, eh, this isn't really for us, which is why the Indian constitution, I don't know if you guys are aware, has what they call um, concurrent lists. So there are some powers which are exclusively for the states, some are exclusive to the federal government, and some which are shared that both sides can do. Um, that, that, that's just the way. But again, it's newer. We've had the benefit of doing that, although mm, concurrent lists, mm, yeah, that's a bit of a two-edged sword. Um, now, uh, so that that's essentially how we got to be where we are now. Um, Mother Britain still hung around, though. So we still had our governor general, and each of the states still had their individual governors. And the system of courts in Australia still allowed you, if you wanted to, if you didn't like the decision of the Australian High Court, you go to Britain. Go to what's called the Privy Council and appeal decisions of the Australian High Court. You were able to do that for most of the 20th century. Um, because to be honest, after Federation, not much changed. It really didn't. The first 20 years, the High Court didn't decide many cases. And it wasn't until... Uh, 1920-ish, the engineers case, where they actually said, oh no, actually the federal government can do things. Oops. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, no, actually the federal government does have power to do a whole host of things. Um, yeah. And so things changed from that point onwards. And it particularly changed when this stuff started to come into it. Because during the war, what's one of the key things you need to do when you're fighting a war? Pay for it. And so the federal government in the Second World War, took the income tax, and they never gave it back. I mean, strictly speaking, they said to all of the states, yeah, that's fine. You can still carry on taxing if you want to, but we're going to tax as well. And if you think your constituents are going to be happy with you taxing income and us taxing income, well, that's really up to you. Um, and so that's why the states, the state of Queensland is completely broke. Is in the space of this lecture, the state of Queensland has lost like $10 million dollars. Um, largely in interest payments because they've already spent the money. So if anybody, and so the key thing here, federal government controls the GST and the income tax. That's why all the states go to the federal government with their little begging bowls and say, please, may we have some more? Or you, the Western Australia goes and say, oi, we contributed more to this than we should have more. Um, neither strategy is very successful. Um, it's, they've all got all sorts of funny little rules and political parties and uh, I don't know how it works. It's all behind closed doors in this country. Again, transparency rating. It's not... Australia could work on some things. Okay, now this idea of going to Mother Britain, if you didn't like what the High Court of Australia said, it sounds a bit dumb. I mean, really? Come on, it's, it's the 21st century now. We, surely we've cut the umbilical ties from Britain. Well, no, it took a really long time. You appreciate that when Australia was formed, most of the people in Australia still thought of themselves as being citizens of Her Majesty's Empire, just. Queen Victoria died that year, I think. Um, and that association with being British was meant that there was no great rush to change things. Um, has anybody here ever had to... Uh, Oh, it was an example. Bias. Uh, had anything involved in courts, particularly for you guys that run businesses and stuff? Have you had to go to the courts for anything? To have a dispute? Did it take a really long time to sort out? Not for the business, but like personal. Yeah. Personal stuff. Okay. Did it take a long time? Yeah, it takes like a lifetime. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Like that. In fact, a friend of mine is a, uh, he's, a, he's in, in Rajasthan and uh, he's a solicitor and he, he says one of the horrible things um, to do with literacy. Um, in the criminal law, and he said, um, you know, sorry, this is, sometimes the subject matter gets a little bit dark. Um, he finds, particularly in, in uh, remote and r rural areas, that they found as a, as a strategy, delaying the trial 
particularly in things like rape cases, where the um, uh, you know the person, the person who the, the rapee, the person, the victim, sorry, that's the wrong word, um, can't read, delaying the trial, which is quite easy to do in the court system, reaches the point where they're going and producing evidence five years later. And it's, you know, it's all incoherent because you can't read and regurgitate. So it's one of those horrible strategic things, but the legal system goes at its own pace. Everything is so slow to change. And partially that's because it's a little protected monopoly. Lawyers quite like being able to charge lots of money and they, as a result, have a very strong vested interest to not change it quickly. Um, and partially because we don't like to make sweeping changes. When we think about the courts and the court system, um, we have what's called a common law system, which I'll talk about soon. Um, and th so the way that judges make law, they don't like to change them quickly. You don't like to just take what a previous judge has done and, oh no, I don't like it that way, let's change it this. And then next week it changes there. Because, and again, going back to accounting, that adds risk to the system, uncertainty, it's risk. And if one thing the British were very good at was analyzing pretty early on that uncertainty and risk cost money. When you make investments that are risky, they have to earn more interest, otherwise no one does it. And so having a legal system with certainty that is slow to change is actually kind of hardwired into it. Um, so leave that one on the back of your mind. Sadly, because at some stage in your life, almost all of you guys are going to have to walk inside a courthouse and have to go and deal with the superstructure, and it will make you sad. Hmm. Okay, um, the other thing, no, yes, they did s s finally sever the umbilical cord in 1986. In 1986 is the last year, so the years you need to know, 1788, 1901, and 1986, the three years. Again, anyone wants to do the citizenship test, you'll need to know those three dates. Do we have those three years for the... For the, for the exam? Uh, look, the exam's actually interesting because I'm going to give you guys um, previous year exams to go through and have a look at. So you're going to see that. So last year, I actually asked this question, what happened in 1992? What happened? And it's like, oh no, what important event in Australian sovereignty happened in 1992? And I'm interested. Do you guys, even those that have grown up in Australia, what happened in 1992? Oh, okay, it's a good story. It's the next one I'll tell, but a little bit later on. Something happened that actually involved this university, which is quite interesting. Um, anyway, the last thing to know, 1996 was the Australia Acts. So they passed the UK Parliament and the British Parliament came together, passed that, said no more, no more appealing from the High Court to Britain, no more, it's done, you've had it. All continuing ones will carry on, so if you'd applied before, uh, whenever it was 1996, I can't remember the date, um, then you can carry on and, and by the end of the 80s that all finished, but no more can you appeal. The highest court in Australia is the High Court of Australia. Oddly, every other country, what do they call the highest court? Supreme. Supreme Court. Every other country has that. Why is it called the High Court in Australia and the Supreme Court of the various colonies? History. Because when it started, as the colony of New South Wales, the Supreme Court was the, the top court. And the Federation came later. So that came, they had to put another court above this one and they couldn't think of a better name. You know, the Super Supreme Court, it, doesn't, it didn't, didn't really work. So it's, it's tricky. Um, New Zealand has only had a Supreme Court for about 10 years or so. Um, we had the Privy Council. One of the nice things about the Privy Council, that again, Kiwis, we care about this, the British would pay for it. That's a really important consideration because courts are really expensive. And so that's what was one, seriously, this is one big political reason why New Zealand was very slow in getting rid of having that final avenue of appeal because they didn't have to pay for it. Bombs did. It's great. Okay. Um, now, so in Queensland, we have uh, the courts are divided into three levels, kind of three, kind of four levels, but I'll explain how that works. If you punch someone and you don't really do too much damage to them, um, or you've got a civil matter that needs to go to court and it's less than $150,000, so it's minor criminal matters, um, minor traffic offences, and civil matters of, of less than $150,000, you go to the magistrate's court. Um, a magistrate is a person who deals with a lot of cases every day. They will not take very long with your matter. If you don't like a decision of the matter, of magistrate, section 
222 of the Justices Act. It's a very, very old piece of legislation. Justice Act, like 1886, lets you appeal decision of magistrate to the district court. So that's kind of the next level in the Queensland court system. Don't like a decision of the magistrate, you can appeal to the district court. That's, that's that. So, and look, from this point forward, by the way, you guys are going to be living in Queensland for a decent period of time. This is a helpful piece of information to know. Um, uh, this is the starting point for your things. And I actually had most classes, people come up to me and say, oh, I'm having this difficulty with this camera, or I'm having this difficulty with my ex-wife, or I'm having this difficulty here. That's fine. I'm, I'm actually allowed to give legal advice these days, although I'm not allowed to charge for it. Oh, it's so disappointing. I don't do volunteer work. Um, now, if you have a civil matter that's less than $750,000, but more than $150,000, a house you're buying or selling a house there's a dispute it's you know 300 grand you go to the district court or if you have if there's what's called an indictable matter an indictment is a formal document that says a person has done something bad serious enough for it to warrant a trial by jury the district court the criminal matters have juries generally you can the defendant can choose not to but nine times out of ten they, they do they want a jury now, um, so th things that would go to the district court are rape, grievous bodily harm. That's when you, you beat someone up so badly they're not going to ever recover properly. That's essentially what grievous bodily harm is. Um, stealing a lot of money. Stealing a million dollars, you're going to go to the district court. Um, and what other sort of things that go there? Uh, very, very, very serious traffic matters. Um, you, know, you slam into a bunch of kids or something like that. If it's very, very serious criminal matters, it goes to what's called the Supreme Court. Now, the District Court and the Supreme Court essentially sit on the same level. They just deal with different amounts of seriousness. So murder goes to the Supreme Court. Okay, the Supreme Court of Queensland. Um, they have unlimited jurisdiction to hear any dollar amount and award anything. And, but they're not an appellate court. What that means is that you're not appealing from the district or the magistrate's court to the Supreme Court. It has original jurisdiction to hear serious matters. Okay. If you don't like your decision in the district or the Supreme Court, you can appeal. You have a statutory right to appeal. Um, remember all of these things. If you do get trigger happy and you think the judge is an idiot and you want to do an appeal, remember that every time you lose, you're going to have to pay someone's costs. So it ends up being very, very expensive. But the Queensland Court of Appeal, or strictly speaking, it's called the Queensland Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, is three Supreme Court judges sitting together to hear your appeal, and they will only deal with issues or defects of law. There's a first piece of legal information that if you didn't know, you need to tuck away in your head. Appeals only care about legal defects they don't care about facts what that means they will never overturn what the jury says if the jury says we believe you and we don't believe you the court of appeal doesn't displace that had nothing to do with that that that's that is a trial that is your peers 12 of your peers have determined that you know they believe this person and not this person you can't appeal that. You can't appeal the, those what are called issues of fact. Only defects of law. Look, sometimes issues of law can be very carefully intertwined with that, particularly things like how the judge instructed the jury to go away and deliver, uh, deliberate over a problem. That can be a problem. Or the rules of evidence. What things were put before the jury for them to consider. That's an issue of law. They are often in criminal matters anyway, the things that end up being appealed. Now, if you don't like the decision of the Queensland Court of Appeal, and there was a JCU law student who actually managed to do this, and I'll tell you about it in a moment, you can choose to go, the final court of call is to go to the High Court. You can appeal decisions of the Queensland Court of Appeal to the High Court, but you have to get what's called leave to appeal. What that means is that you have to go sit in front of a couple of high court judges and say, we need to go to the high court because this is important. Not just because we feel like it. 
don't have an automatic right to appeal to the High Court, you have to seek leave. And that's an important consideration because it means that if your matter, either they look at it, just have a preliminary look, and like, no, you haven't got a snowball's chance in hell, mate. Or it doesn't have any sort of public interest. It's like, okay, yeah, there's, there's, there may be some rights infringed there. There might be some problem. We don't think it's worth our time to go through and do. You won't get leave. You actually won't get leave. And the decision stays with the Court of Appeal. Um, also, if you do go to the High Court and there's a split decision, now, normally you'll have an odd number of judges, but occasionally a judge, for example, may have to recuse themselves. It actually happens sometimes, by the way, if the judge actually sat. Somebody's gone into the High Court, but they were actually involved in the case at an earlier stage. And if that happens and it's evenly decided, it does happen occasionally, Mon Monis, does that name ring a bell? The Lint Cafe murderer. Yeah, he'd actually gone to the High Court He'd written some letters to Townsville soldiers accusing them of, um, sorry, the wives of deceased soldiers in Townsville, uh, accusing them being um, the wives of murderers and rapists. And he went to the High Court and it was a split decision because one, one of the judges had retired. A split decision means the High Court can't decide, so they leave the decision of the Court of Appeal intact. The relevant Court of Appeal. Okay, um, another thing you need to note and again, look, this is in your text. It was boring to read these sorts of textbooks and reading about the structure of courts. I think we go over it again next week as well. But just make note, the, um, the, the federal system have their own courts. A federal court and a family court. Um, and they have their own systems of appeal. They have a little a local federal court and they have a little baby one that hears small matters, the name of which keeps changing every few years. It used to be called the Federal Magistrates Court. Then it was the Federal Circuit Court. Now it's called the Federal something or other court. I'm not even sure. I have to go and check. If you don't like a decision of that, you can go to what's called the full federal court, which is between three and five federal court judges sitting together determining your appeals. If you don't like that, you can go to the high court. Again, if you get leave. All right. Does anyone have any questions on that? Uh, the Australian court system in seven minutes. Transition this guy. Now, I know that I've been talking with a bit of, um, sort of gusto about the criminal matters and civil matters. And I'm just going to step back a bit. Does everyone know what the difference here between a civil matter and a criminal matter is? I'm hoping you do just from your background knowledge. But I, I guess the formal definition of this distinction between criminal and civil, criminal law is about the state. It is not about victims. It is not about the other side. It is not about particular groups of people. Criminal law is about punishing you for doing things society considers bad. It's not about compensation. It's all about this punishment and retribution. It's not about making things right in terms of you reallocating funds to do that, you know, to fix it. It's about us punishing you. Criminal law, in theory, you know, it's only about doing bad things, particularly if you are a very functional member of society. Say you are a person who goes and does charity work and you do um, you run a business that employs a lot of people and then you do something bad, you know, you stab someone, you go to jail. Society doesn't benefit from this from economically. You've got to go through the police have got to do, you've got to pay the police, you've got to pay the court system, you've got to have defence and prosecution so sides come together and then you've got to send you as a generally 99% you know, of the time good member of society who earns money and, and employs people and pays taxes, you go to jail where you don't do anything for a period of time. That's not efficient. Not efficient at all. It's a terrible waste of resources. We don't care. Criminal law is about setting things in place to try and curb behavior. As it, don't stab people. If you don't stab people, you don't go to jail for stabbing people. I know it's a little bit cheeky, but fundamentally that's what it's about. It's about deterring and punishing. And look, to be honest with people that are going to do it anyway, there's also a bit of protection to society as well. Some people are going to get out of jail and then go and commit stuff again. They just do. Um, there's, there's a whole area, by the way, essentially it's like a social science called criminology. That's its own thing. It's not kind of tangential to law. It's kind of tangential to psychology and sociology. They study criminal behavior and the thought patterns that go with it. Um, and one thing you'll find, and again, people that have dealt with the criminal law for a long, long, long time, it's very depressing. Um, sounds funny for you guys, most of you who, who are doing accounting. Um, in many ways, 
Doing accounting is much more upbeat. Not having to deal with people who have done horrible things to small children all the time. Having to deal with that all the time and having to switch that off when you walk out of thing and is um yeah, it can really get you down. My friends are criminal lawyers and they it, it really gets you down. Particularly when the same people come back multiple times. And our laws are set up, you are innocent until proven guilty. Even if everyone knows it. Everyone knows that the person's done it. There's some reason, some legal defect to stop a person from being found guilty. They are not guilty. And they do not suffer any punishment. Might suffer social stigma, of course, but in terms of the criminal law, it's, it's a very much a binary uh, system in our system. Not in all systems. I don't know. Again, I'm not sure about uh, I'm not sure about Bangladesh's system whether or not it has. Does it have much of the Islamic influence in the system at all? It's not. It's very much not at all. Okay, I don't know that because it's one thing you find oddly um, the Scot system. If you go to Scotland, they have a separate category. You have guilty, obviously. And you have innocent, and then you have, or no, sorry, guilty and not guilty, and then not proven. It's when some form of legal defect happens that we, you know, the jury thinks that you did it, but they can't prove beyond reasonable doubt that you did it, or there's some defect in the thing. So you get off, but it says not. It's a, it's a, it's a slightly different getting off. The world knows that you, you know, we think you did it, but there's no sanction. It wasn't proven on reasonable doubt in the court of law. I know, funny people, the Scots. Okay, um, so that's civil and criminal. Sometimes you'll see these textbooks that will just stop there. You see civil law and criminal law. Civil law, though, in terms of the meaning that I've got up here, is really about citizens in relation to each other. So if somebody punches you, that's a crime, assuming you didn't provoke it and do all, so there's all sorts of excuses and will act and so on. But... There's two things that flow from this. Yes, sure, there's a crime. The person can go to jail. If they go to jail, what does that get you? The person got punched in the head. What does that do you? How does that make you feel better? Does it make you feel better? Some people, it doesn't make you feel at all. I mean, that's very much uh, flows from the um, things like the Buddhist and the other Dharmic faiths as well. There's no, there's no benefit to me, economically, to a person who punched me going to jail. I, I mean, if I've got a retributive streak, I might say, oh, they deserved it. It's, uh, eye for an eye and all of, all of that. But dollar-wise, and again, well, we're doing essentially an accounting subject here, economically, that doesn't help you at all. So there is this corresponding right to sue for dollars. Now, one of the real problems about being punched in the head by 19-year-olds, drunken 19-year-olds in Flinders Street, what's the problem with suing drunken 19-year-olds punching people in Flinders Street? What's the, the single biggest problem? They ain't got no money. You got no money, no point. And so that's why a lot of these things... And governments have realized that too. So they often have things like victim compensation schemes, where they've sort of socialized that. Um, but there was a, an Australian swimmer by the name of Nick Darcy. Does that ring a bell to any of you guys? It, um, anyone know what happened to Nick Darcy? What did he do? Do you remember? Mm. Uh, no, no he, he, got, he got boozed. He did get boozed. But he punched one of his teammates, broke his jaw. Guy couldn't swim for ages, had to have a wire and everything. Um, yeah, it was a criminal matter, so it got found beyond reasonable doubt to have um, you know, committed GBH or whatever, assault. I think it's assault occasioning bodily harm in that case. Well, Nick Darcy had money, so what did the guy do? Sued him. Sued him. It's the tort of battery, and he got a $100,000 because the guy had a lot of money. So there you go. There's a golden rule. People in business only sue people, this, I learned this doing business law as an undergrad oh, 20 odd, 25 years ago, deep pockets theory, they call it, only sue people that have money. There's no point doing it any other way. But also note, one class of entities have deep pockets, insurance companies. So the, the idea of what I'm teaching you guys in law, in terms of suing and not suing people, just make note, a lot of these things are backed up by insurance companies. It's not strictly speaking, Nick Darcy that's being sued, you know, if he has some sort of insurance system in place, they are the ones that end up having to pay for these, these sorts of things, particularly with things like personal injury. Okay, other categories of law, constitutional law. Um, our, when I say our, I mean Australia's constitution doesn't do much. It doesn't have a lot of powers, uh, sorry, it doesn't have a lot of intrinsic rights of citizens. Australia's constitution is set up 
to map out what the powers of the federal government are, the, the courts, the executive, and the parliament. And that's pretty much it. That's what it does. It doesn't have a lot of individual rights for people to do things. There are some, what we call express rights, but they looked at what the Americans did. <laughs> and they were just like, right to bear arms, no thanks. You know, uh, right to um, freedom of speech, no thanks. Now, there are some express rights. You have the express right, for example, uh, the area, one of my research areas was on section 92, which is the most litigated section of the Australian Constitution for many years. Um, freedom of trade between the states has to be free. And freedom of movement. You're always allowed to move between the states of Australia. It's an absolute prohibition against stopping having borders between the, between the two. Um, can't think of any other off the top of my head, but there are a handful of other individual rights. What they found though over time, and this is going back to an ex-JCU law student, the courts have taken what's written in the constitution and stretched it a bit. So it says, there is to be a parliament. So what the courts, high court has done over many years is say, well, really, if there's to be a parliament, and the parliament is to be elected following this process that's mapped out in the constitution, we really have to stretch that out and say, well, for that to have any meaning, you really have to have elections, right? And people need to talk during elections freely in order for this to have any meaning. So they stretch this out to say, well, really, there's an implied right to political communication. And there was a JCU law student who was on Flinders Street when it was a pedestrian mall, handing out, uh, Pat Coleman was the guy's name, handing out pamphlets with pictures of local police officers. Hey, everybody, come meet your local corrupt police officers, handing them out to people. And so you know, the cops are like, come on, Pat, move along. And they're like, no, you can't arrest me. Oh, oh, look, there's Brendan Power. Look, he's a corrupt police officer, everybody. Look, everybody, Brendan Power, corrupt police officer is arresting me. And so it's, um, and the local DPP guys, they laugh because they, they got to deal with this matter. So it was a very minor matter, um, tr trespass, and he bumped one of the police officers. But the issue that went to the local magistrate's court when Pat was there was, and he tried to argue, do I have an implied right to do this? And they, I can't just remember who won at first instance. I suspect that he lost. So it went under Section 222 of the Justice Act, the District Court, and I think he lost there as well. Then it went to the Queensland Court of Appeal, and from the Court of Appeal went to the High Court. So there's a case that all the law students have to study in constitutional law, it's called Coleman and Power, which was a local JCU law student who had to go to the High Court. Turns out they did say, yes, you have a right of implied freedom of political communication. Yes, handing out the pamphlets is fine. Punching a police officer, not so much. You're, still, you're, not, get, you're not getting up on that pad. So that, that's how that panned out. Okay, the final area of law, or broad area of law that we have locally too, is regulation. And it is everywhere. There are so many rules for so many aspects of our life um, that are just designed to keep society ordered. It's to try and keep the structures in place, to try and stop us from needing to go to the courts to have to resolve things. I don't have to go to the courts to sue the council Oh, sounds like a very good example. Um, I don't have to go and sue Woolworths for putting snails inside bottles of ginger beer. Um, I know that there are government bodies that will go and check up on that. And if they do fall below a certain standard, those government bodies will take care of that. I pay my taxes, and these government bodies go off and do that sort of regulatory stuff. And part of that, though, if you're Woolworths or you're Coca-Cola or whoever supplies it, you have to jump through those hoops to make sure your product is a sufficient level of safety. That is done independent of people suing and being sued, independent of this civil um, law or civil system. Okay, uh, it's bang on eight o'clock. So we'll take a short break. Sorry, I expect this to be quick. We'll take a quick break now and then we'll just spend maybe about half an hour more. Is that about right? You guys are probably bored by this stage. Um, so we'll take, take a short break and come back.
We've only got like five slides or something to go. It's not gonna. Let's do this. All right, so just quickly again, this is all just about law in the broad sense. Uh, so there's a distinction here that we make between um, uh, different types of international law. So you have domestic law, you have international law. All right, we think about law of, um, of the inside a country. So the laws of the state of Queensland or the Commonwealth of Australia, and that jurisdiction extends to the borders around there. In fact, in ye old times, it was the six mile rule you want to know what the six mile rule was? That was the, as far as you could shoot your cannon from land. That was the extent of your border. That was what jurisdiction was. Um, and thinking about a real politic, an actual, you know, very, very real, tangible boundary, that's what that was. Now, um, but when we think of international law, when we say the, the phrase international law, we usually think of the law between nations. You know, um, Australia enters into an arrangement with Indonesia to you know, do something to settle a dispute or what have you, um, or a double taxation agreement, because I sound exciting. So you've got a country that you want to have um, taxation um, exchanges or to recognize each other's rules or systems. You do that between nations. Now, most countries, that's done at a national level. Australia, having a relatively recent constitution, makes that an exclusive power of the federal government. So the state of Queensland can't go, uh, what's the premier's name, Eliza Palaszczuk. She can't go and create a treaty with Indonesia for taxation. It's express. It's only the federal government can do that. And same with uh, most modern, it's certainly the only one as well. The federal government's the one that does that. You can have arrangements. States can go and have and cut deals with other things, but they're not strictly speaking the same type of international law, the, the law between nation states themselves. Now, you can, however, and this again does sound pretty logical, have um, private international law. So that is things that are done by citizens, between citizens and either citizens and other nations or citizens and citizens in other countries. Who's bought something on PayPal? Come on. Really? No one's ever bought anything on paper. Who's bought something from overseas and had it shipped from overseas to here? This is a pretty common phenomenon these days. And, I mean, it's interesting when you stop to look at this because um, you know, PayPal's not based in Australia and sometimes you're buying something, I mean, obviously it's based in the US, um, the Visa company. Com the company, not the Visa rules for um, those visas, but the actual visa, the credit card companies. Again, most of these are, are controlled by US banking institutions. But if I'm buying something from, I don't know, France, often you do it via PayPal and it's backed up. You pay with your little visa and the, it just happens. And if something bad happens, what's the dispute mechanism? Well, usually these things are actually set up so that the US entity just acts essentially as a broker. You, has anyone had a dispute with PayPal or with um, Visa or credit cards or anything? Had to go back and sort things out? They sort it out themselves, often by just giving you your money back. If you actually wanted to try and uh, sue somebody in France, good luck to you. Yeah, good luck to you for that $100 handbag trying to bring an action to do that. But it can happen. And again, next week I'll talk about going to the history of things again, the, going, back to the, uh, going back to the British, things like boats. When the dollar values start adding up, you add four decimal points to the thing that you're buying and your $100 handbag is, you know, $10,000 handbags is actually worth seeking if you can seek some sort of, uh, bring some sort of action. And the systems they use, particularly this idea of the choice of jurisdiction, because usually, you're suing in a domestic court, the question is which one? And these rules can be really complex. And again, going back to the idea of boats, um, because you could literally be, you know, say that you're, a, uh, you're an American living in New York who's bought a shipload of corn from merchants in Turkey, uh, shipping it, the shipping company is, uh, or the, the agent that you use is, is Greek, 
the boat is flagged in Panama and there's a dispute when the, the corn ends up in Malta and then is seized by um, you know, agents of the Italian government. So it's like, well, what do you do? And so this idea of trying to resolve these disputes and, and again, they talk about this forum uh, non convenes, it's a Latin phrase, to talk about the choice of place to have the matter heard. And often, when we do um, our contractual uh, contract law stuff, usually you choose that in advance. Um, so for all of those that have bought things on paper, anyone know where it's, which law it falls under? Usually, it's the law of a particular state in the US, doesn't have sales tax, Delaware. You wouldn't believe how many things, when you go through the contract, it says this is governed by the laws of Delaware, because I presume that's the place they've got no sales tax. I, I'm presuming. There's, there's a few states that have no oh, sales tax. Oh, there you go. Um, and that's why, I, again, I'm, I'm not completely out as to why that is, but I presumed it was because it was just easiest to do business there. Oddly, if you go back 150 years, when disputes of, um, to do with admiralty, again, boats. Boats are really expensive. People have been having disputes about boats for a long time. It was quite common for um, big merchants and vendors to have disputes involving shipping, even though it didn't involve the British, to actually have it done in the British Admiralty Courts. Not because either side thought they would get an advantage, but because they knew the British for a long time that had very, very solid rules and systems. It's not that we like the British, it's not that we think we're getting an advantage there, but we know that if they're going to do it, they're going to do it properly. And you're going to have the rules of evidence and apply. You're going to be able to, both sides are going to be able to hear um, and present their case and to have an impartial um, adjudicator as part of that system and also systems of appeal as well. Um, so that was how, that was why that was a thing. Okay. Um, I've often wondered, by the way, when, um, and looking at business law, how useful this particular stuff is. It's very tangential to the actual mechanical stuff that you guys need to know, usually for your accounting background. It's the sort of thing that, you know, you'll probably, it'll go in one year, out the other, and in tw 10 years' time when you're thinking about uh, university education, you're wondering, what was that ball guy raving about? Um, uh, knowing things, and things in the broad sense, is just a really useful thing to do in life. It's a good thing to become an interesting human being. Uh, to know a lot of stuff about a lot of things. And again, I go back, and again, particularly for you know, guys from the subcontinent, it's uh, my 48-year-old uh, Rajasthani friend who's faced with this life that she didn't expect to have. Now she's in Australia and has this freedom to go at age 48 to pick and choose what she wants to do with her life. Um, and knowing a lot of things about a lot of things can inform that decision. My mother was a school teacher for most of her working life, hated it. Absolutely hated it. She just basically, you know, finished school, had, got to get a job, went and got a job, and did that. Started at age 55, she'd give it all up to become essentially, I'm not kidding, a pet travel agent. And she loves it. And the hilarious thing was, she made stack tons of money. It was bizarre. It was always her passion. Anyway, there's, there's all those, um, you know, had, under the age of 55, there's still hope for you yet. Okay, now, we... And when we think about laws around the world, um, and we think about different countries, and again, people in this room, there's about 10 different um, nationalities. We think about the systems that we have. They're not all the same. They don't operate the same. They've come from different traditions. And most traditions flow from what we call the civil law system. What that means is that everything gets written down, usually by parliament or arms of the government who are tasked with prescribing what the law is. Um, anyone know where this comes from? Well, strictly speaking, it comes from uh, Hammurabi, great Babylonian leader, you know, 3,000 years ago. But there was a guy who, in one of those many wars that were fought across Europe, a guy called Napoleon Bonaparte, um, who grabbed in this, this great defiant moment of all of the monarchies of Europe grabbed the crown and put it on his own head. Anyway, maybe that comes up in a trivia night. The person who crowned Napoleon was himself. He raised an army and waged war. And he waged war all across Europe. Uh, did he win? Well, eventually, no. Uh, it turns out, don't invade Russia. It, it doesn't end well. Um, 
But one of the things he did do was to create a code. So the Napoleonic Code was one of the great civil law texts, and a lot of the other European nations took that up. Which was the one country in Europe that didn't want to do anything Napoleon said? Britain. So they never took up Napoleon's Code. That would be heresy. The British have what's called judge-made law. So judges for a long time would make law. Parliament didn't do very much. In fact, Parliament didn't even really exist in the contemporary sense until the late 1600s. The king sometimes would create statutes, not very many. Judges made law, and the decisions that judges made would bind judges, subsequent judges, coming across the same thing. They call it the doctrine of stare decisis, and we'll talk about that next week. But what we say, though, is that the British, with their judge-made law, is a common law system. Judges are a source of law, and that is in Britain, in Australia, um, still in India as well, even though you, things are pretty heavily codified these days, but India is still essentially a, um, a common law nation. Again, 1947, we want to do as many things as possible to try and remove the British from the process, but still fundamentally it still is. Judges make law and the, the Supreme Court, when it says things, matter. Um, another big powerful nation that's a common law nation in North America, the United States is a common law nation. They don't like the British either. They've hated them for about as long as you fellas have, but still fundamentally, it, judges make law. And in fact, if anything in, the, in North America, the US in particular, judge made law is, is a bit more powerful because their constitution has a lot more powers in it for them to strike down law, to actually say this law is invalid. And so they're over there, their judges essentially have more power. Those are not the only systems. The socialist system, which is essentially a civil law system, is the idea that fundamentally all law flows from this great brotherhood slash sisterhood we have with our community-owned property. And so social law is usually considered to be a distinct and separate area of law. Kind of really a civil law system, but it's sufficiently different that they, um, they do that. Because ultimately, in China, I'm thinking particularly here, ultimately, every, everything, every aspect of law is responsible to the party. All right. Fundamentally, when we think about the rule of law, yeah, sure. The Chinese have had very structured laws for a very long time. And the, Confucian, the Confucian system it was all about the structuring of laws. But fundamentally, under the socialist system, the Communist Party of China um, has the ultimate power to do and to undo. Um, whereas here, we don't have that, that system. And nowhere else in any of the countries that anybody in this room is. Um, one other important system, yep. No, no. The, the Napoleon, Napoleon had the Great Code. So we call it the Napoleonic Code. In other countries, they didn't want to call it the Napoleonic Code because that's French. We don't want to be French. No one wants to be French. Um, and so the, the Germans, for example, they created their civil code, derived it from the French. Um, and as the Germans do, they engineered it a bit. And they, they mapped things out in a little bit more depth. So it's more German and less French. Um, the Swiss also had a very, very good code that got picked up. So you find a lot of the code um, countries around the world, often um, you know, ex-colonial nations, when you cast off the shackles of the British Empire, you, you want to change your law to grab a code. Um, the, the Swiss one it was a very popular uh, system. And so, that is civil law. Most countries are civil law. It's actually rare. 70% um, of the world's population has uh, civil law systems, codified rules. The raw laws are mapped out. Judges don't make law. They follow what's written out. If there's a defect, oh, well, too bad. We'll get the government to come and fix the defect later on. Whereas in the common law system, judges, and the British in particular, would make a decision, say, oh, okay, you've killed that person's sheep. I decide in favor of you, and I'll write my reasons down. And those reasons get recorded. And when if that same thing comes up again, judges are bound by that decision. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's what it was. Napoleon didn't like didn't like judges doing anything. In fact, he didn't like anyone else doing anything except him. If you think about it, it's him controlling. He wants to map it out and make it as best he can. Um, Saudi Arabia, though, is a country. And there are some others too as well, but uh, that have a religious system. So you have Sharia, and ultimately that sits at the top of the system. And again, strictly speaking, it's, it is a civil law system. Judges don't make law. 
it's codified, but ultimately all the system is still responsible to the religious group or entity and those things. And so how that manifests itself varies by jurisdiction. Saudi Arabia is obviously the most, the most famous one of these, but fundamentally it's, it's, it flows from, um, from a particular religion and power. Okay. Australia is a common law country and that we we say it and look this is describing broadly what the system is in all of the systems there's a little bit of a mix of both aspects because let's face it when you're reading a code two parties are going two reasonable parties could read the code differently and so somebody has to determine and decide what it is but the fundamental thing about the code countries is that that decision doesn't form a separate source of law in itself. In Australia, if the Queensland Court of Appeal determines, for example, that um, there's a case we'll do later on here, Queensland Court of Appeal determines that common mistake is no longer an equitable principle, and that's just gibberish, but you'll, you'll, you'll learn that later, that binds all lower courts, all Queensland courts are bound by that decision. So if somebody comes up, tries to argue, oh no, equity should be involved in common law mistake, no. Nope. Queensland Court of Appeal in the Australian Estates case said that it's not. And so that decision of the court is a source of law in itself. That's the, really the fundamental difference here. When judges make law in common law countries, those decisions are sources of law in themselves. And, uh, and that's, um, so for example, here, an interesting one comes from JCU, which I'm going to talk about more, is like the Marbo decision, for example. That is this pivotal moment in Australian legal history that is absolutely judge-made law. Judges, and so that, that, that is the source of that particular principle. Okay, I'll skip the slide. That's fine, because I've talked about um, that. We'll talk about separation of powers. How many more have we got? One, two, I need a few more slides. Okay, so we have a system. Yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. I've got a mouse up there. Probably a bit late in the days of doing that. Going back to Thomas Hobbes, if we could play every card in our hand, if we could be king, we would want all the money, we want all the pain, we want all the power, we want, want everything. What we've realised though, thrashing about in human history, is that doing that never ends well. Never, ever, ever. Does concentrating power end well? And this, going back to the party, when I refer to the party, I refer to specifically to the Communist Party of China, is going to end badly. I'm probably going to get censored for this. We, and I say we, this happened in Britain uh, over a couple of steps, a couple of accidents. We have only come to where we're at through accident, all right? The king always wanted to be the king. In the year 1066, William of Normandy, oh, by the way, all of, for thousands of years, the French always thought they owned Britain and the British always thought they owned France. It's a useless piece of history. So the king of Normandy, which is in France, thought he owned England, so he went and conquered it and he won. And so 1066 is really the, the starting point in terms of British history. And it's the starting point we have for legal history as well. Because um, might is right. Conquered it, I'm now the king. Why am I the king? Because I've got the army. There is no higher power. No one, I don't have to listen to anybody. I've got the army. It's my sword. And so that's how that worked. Now, something happened. And the, well, all kings, you have good kings and you have bad kings. And they had a terrible king in the 13th century, a guy called King John. You notice that no king of England has ever been called John since then. And he was terrible. He was a useless ruler, raised taxes, everyone hated him. And so a bunch of um, uh, barons, who essentially they're below the king, this is pretty brave, grabbed him, shirt fronted him, to use a Tony Abbottism, and got him to sign a document that says, you will not imprison free men, you will not raise an army without that, and you will call us together, the barons, the biggest, baddest bullies in the land. The collection, by the way, was called the Parliament. It's not what we would think of Parliament now. 
They were they were bullies on all of the, the land that they controlled. Grabbed them together and got them to sign a document. The document was called the Great Charter or the Magna Carta in the year 1215. And that document is like the founding document that starts this separation of powers because it reduced the absolute divine power of the King of England to do whatever the heck he liked. And that document still is a part of Australian law today. Can't just arbitrarily imprison people. I, I taught administrative law last semester. One of the things about this thing called the writ of habeas corpus. You can't, the, the, the executive arm of government does not have the power to just grab somebody and lock them up. The courts always have the power to call them before the court to, to, to create what's called a writ, a document that says you are to bring that person before the court to, to have the matter heard. And this again essentially flows from the Magna Carta. That was in 1215. Uh, in England, as I mentioned before about the Treaty of Westphalia, how they weren't playing. They didn't want to play in those in the Thirty Years' War because they had their own problems because they were fighting a war. Uh, England was a republic. How good is that? For nine years. Did you guys know that? I think it was a republic. Yeah, they, they cast off the monarch, chopped his head off, and said, right, we're a republic now. What was the problem with this? Well, the problem was the guy who did it. Anyone know the guy's name? A guy called Oliver Cromwell. The trouble with Oliver Cromwell is that he was a very fearsome gentleman. And he was what's called a Puritan. So that uh, some branch of Christianity where you are not to have fun. Life is not about fun. Life is to work. Life is to produce, life is to be miserable and die. So he banned everybody from singing, drinking, dancing, basically anything that would make England at all palatable to, for anybody to possibly live. He banned it. And so life was horrible. Uh, so they, they literally had nine years of civil war, Parliament won, yay! And it was Cromwell was in charge and it was, it was horrible. And so what happened was once Cromwell, oh, oh and after Cromwell, who'd overthrown this terrible institution of the monarchy, who does he install as his successor when he's about to die? Guess who? His son. So his son, fortunately, was not very well liked. and He got shirt fronted. And, uh, and so what the bunch of parliamentarians, are, they're stuck with a bit of a problem. Who are we going to make the ruler? So what they did is they brought back the old king, or rather not the old king, he had his head chopped off. It was the son of the old king. So they brought back Charles. So Charles III got brought back and said, be good. And look... He brought back drinking and singing and dancing, and so that was all good. He was known as the Merry King, and that was fine. Problem started when his brother took over. His brother, as well as being a little bit more happy to do the thing that kings were allowed to do back in the day, start to raising army and doing this, he was a pretty bad ruler. And this may not sound like a problem now, but it was certainly a problem back then. He was a Catholic. And that. May not sound like much of a problem, but it was a problem for the English Parliament at the time. So essentially, he got shirt fronted, and they got his niece, who was a, a Protestant, who was married to a Dutch royal. So William and Mary would basically sent a letter: "Hey, do you want to come and be King and Queen of England?" This is essentially what happened. Come, yeah, you want you want to come? So you can come and do that. We'll, we'll sneak you in, get rid of the other guy. We've got some some conditions, though. Some really important conditions. So they wrote out a document. That document is known as the Bill of Rights. That it says, you can come and be King Queen of England, but you have to call Parliament regularly. You, have, you can't raise an army without calling Parliament. You have to do all of these things. You can't arbitrarily arrest people. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do that. So this document, just by dumb luck, further reduced the power of the monarchy and increased the power of Parliament. Okay, so that's just this dumb bit of history. These things don't happen because people, when they get power, do not give it back. That's something to just leave in the back of your mind. We've taken a long time to get here to separate this arbitrary notion of power. It's a really important concept. But to be honest, it's probably more important than pretty much anything you'll take for the rest of your lives from this course. People in power don't like giving it up. And this will bode very poorly for the future of this world if uh, entities that are in place at the moment, these sorts of historic events that stop the British government from being able to do whatever, King from being able to do whatever they want, doesn't apply elsewhere. Um, so we have these three arms, and this is formally enshrined in the Australian Constitution. 
the constitution is the higher power. We don't, we as the people, respect that the constitution, oh, you know, most of us haven't read it. We know that it exists. I mean, Jim Jeffries, an Australian comedian, has a good um, session on this, talking about gun control in the US, or their constitution. Oh, it's the constitution, you can't change the constitution. Like, yes, you can. It's called an amendment. Um, and the yeah, Australian constitution, most of us haven't read it. It doesn't matter. We know that it functions, and we know that people are restricted by it. The courts can't raise an army. It sounds dumb when I'm even saying that. Parliament can't choose to go and arbitrarily detain people unless you're passing things through. And well, possibly they can in the States, but um, we accept that those three arms of government, the court system, Parliament, and the executive, do three different things. Parliament makes laws, passes legislation through there, through very, very careful, rigorous processes. The courts interpret those laws, and again, when there's defects or gaps, they also act as a source of law themselves, but generally, they just do what they're told. And the executive follows and does what Parliament has said being enshrined in law. And again, from time to time, they have to make decisions. Parliament can't map every little decision. Oh, you know, somebody in the tax office needs a new pencil sharpener. Can't go through Parliament to do that. The executive does need discretion to do things, but that's limited by law. If we don't like what Parliament does, what do we do? Nope. Nope. If we don't like what the Queensland government is doing at the moment, every three years, yeah, we just vote new ones in. Yeah, that's it. We just vote someone in. That's it. But for that three years or four years, five years, whatever the term is, they essentially are the supreme power. Parliament, or we call this the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy, is ostensibly more powerful than the other two. They are the ones that can pass laws. Courts have to do what they're told. The executive have to do what they're told. And we do this out of habit. We, as human beings, follow the Constitution by habit. Okay. Uh, very, very quick slides. I'm going to do this in four minutes. There are three slides. Three slides to go. Four slides. Boo. So that, to be honest, is a pretty uh, is a pretty key summary to it. Judges are not elected. That's one problem. So when, that's one of the problems people do say in political discourse. Oh, those unelected judges, they get to go and make the law, and they kind of do. That is a little bit problematic. To be a judge in our system is really hard. You have to be a lawyer for a really long time. Um, and it's, it takes a, a lot of effort to go to reach that level of seniority where you can be appointed to what they call it, we say, to the bench. This is an old phrase um, to describe that. Other jurisdictions, um, I'm a friend of mine's Norwegian, and again, they have a civil law system. You, out of university, can go to judge school. We don't, we think of that as being kind of weird. It's like, what? What do you mean? Yeah, that's true. They, their magistrates are much more involved in the system, a much lower level. It's something you can do as a grad. Go, on, go off and be a judge. Cool, eh? But here, no, you don't do that. That, that just doesn't happen. Um, a couple of other things about the courts, though. Courts, the judge, never gets off her or his seat to go and investigate. That's an important distinction between our system and things like France, where they have an inquisitorial, where the, the magistrate goes with the police through the investigation and looks at the evidence as they go. They go and they take an active part in it. Our courts, in what we call our adversarial system, listen to evidence that's produced and arguments that are produced by two sides and reach a decision. They don't get off their chairs and investigate themselves. They don't do anything. They only do things. They're not elected. And the clearly expressed will of parliament, the courts must follow. So yes, they can make law, make law when there's gaps. Oh, look, parliament didn't think of this, this, and this, and this facts have happened, which parliament didn't think about. Okay, we need to make it up on the fly. That's pretty rare. Generally, they're just following the legislation as best they can. Um, they're also, that last thing, uh, limited to the facts. They can make hypothetical statements. Oh, well, you know, if the facts were this, then this would happen. But that has no legal binding. It doesn't bind any other, any other subsequent courts. When they're making a decision, they can't make stuff up or bring in evidence that wasn't presented to them. Uh, it's a key thing about our, our court system as well. Parliament. Our point of Parliament is to make law. They are the ones 
who have been elected by us, they represent us, they make the laws of the land. And they do that you know, by thrashing the things out. You have one side will argue this, the other side will argue that. Once they've done that, though, and they've passed the legislation, they don't do anything else. They don't interpret the law afterwards. They you know, get feedback from the executive, which is the government, giving that back to them. But they don't do anything else. They don't do that. They pass laws. And they debate the issues. And that's it. You know, get the parliamentarians going out and doing that. Now, there is a little bit of a crossover here. Some countries have a strict separation of powers. So in other words, the executive and parliament are completely separate. The Americans have this. So um, Hillary Clinton, when she wanted to be president, mm -hmm. um, she had to give up her uh, Senate seat in order to seek that. Oh, she, no, sorry, before that. When she was Obama's Secretary of State, she had to give up her um, Senate seat, which was essentially part of their parliament. She had to give that up in order to move into the executive as a secretary, basically a minister, top minister of that particular role. Here we don't have that. In fact, the heads, the ministers, are actually all in parliament as well. What's called, that's called the Westminster system. It's not clean. It doesn't have that clean separation of powers. It seems to work all right. But uh, from time to time it's problematic because you can have a really good person who'd be really good to be the head minister of a particular department and then they lose their seat, their local seat. So the convention, they can't be the minister because the minister has to be an MP. Okay. Uh, all right. Oh, I don't need to know order. Oh, okay, uh, the executive. That is the people who do stuff. The ministries, headed by a minister, do stuff. They're the ones who literally run around, pay all of the civil servants. They are all the civil servants. Every person you deal with, if you have to deal with the Ministry of Immigration, or you have to deal with um, uh, the Department of Communities, or you have to deal with all of these government departments, um, are essentially form part of the executive arm of government. They're doing the law. They have rules. There are rules. Parliament's given them rules. Then they follow those rules as best they can. But they're given discretion to do that. Um, I you probably don't need to go too much into this course, but certainly my previous subject I taught when talking about my relationship with the child support agency is hilarious. Um, but when dealing with staff in that particular agency, they have discretion to choose one way or the other to follow the rules that are given to them. And if they do that wrong, I have appeal rights. I go up to the AAT and have hilarious sessions with them. Um, but they follow the law, but they do have, when the law runs out, they're given decision, they sometimes have to weigh things up in terms of, you know, for example, granting a license. If I'm going to get a license to open a liquor store. That is a member of the executive who's deciding one way or the other. There's rules, but those rules only go so far. It says you need to weigh up these factors. Okay, I now am weighing these factors up and I say yay or nay. That's what the executive does. Um, the army is the ultimate the ultimate part of the executive. Whoever controls the army, at the end of the day, they can kind of do what they like, really, if you think about it like that. Um, the, they are kind of elected in that our system says each of the ministers has to be an MP. So it's a, they're indirectly elected the heads of the various government departments, but everyone below that is not elected. They're picked, appointed, there's... Um, legislation in terms of hiring policy it's all very very structured all right last slide last slide everyone gets to go home thoroughly 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 bored lawyers what do lawyers do yeah, why i'm not even sure to be honest i'm never too sure why this is in this subject I, I've, I've pondered about this I, because it's not in the um it's not in the accounting guidelines but anyway it's in the course i'm going to tell you uh lawyers are actually pretty important not just the greedy little so-and-so's that charge you $500 an hour to do your legal matters. They do actually perform a pretty important function because they are the go-between to the society and the legal system. Now, yes, there's a direct thing where we act as a representative or you call them up and you can pay them to do things, but often there's, you find there are lawyers in government as well, people that know how the law and the legal system works in relation to making decisions. 
the, the, the executive arm as well. Um, all judges are all lawyers. So, so all, literally every person in the, in the judicial arm of government is, is a lawyer. Um, in more recent times, they, they operate in terms of negotiating. One of the things, has anybody had to do formal negotiating where you've got to negotiate a deal or and then map it out in an agreement? Is anybody in business, you guys had to do anything like that? Like that? Sometimes you can get it where you can have a mediator. Uh, you have a third party, a neutral third party to do that. Sometimes the mediators are just happy, smiley people that just want to create a win-win situation. Other times they're structured, they're, they're actually lawyers, they're actually solicitors, because they are in a position to basically and quickly analyze the strength of the various parties and to give them immediate feedback. Um, that can happen as well. Um, and yes, lawyers do trot off to court on behalf of people. You can... In the state of Queensland and in Australia, all of Australia, you are allowed to represent yourself. You can go to court on your own. And uh, Steve Graw, who wrote the textbook, said to me famously many years ago, Simon, if you're a lawyer who goes and represents yourself in court, you have an idiot for a client. Uh, it kind of holds true. We get so emotional about things when it's our matter. So I. Uh, I have represented myself a couple of times in court, um, but it's something that you really, really should try not to do uh, for, as a legal practitioner. But there are some benefits that you guys will get. This is the last thing I'm going to say for this, uh, this lecture. Learning how the law and the legal system works will give you a competitive advantage in the times you have to go on your own to court. I guarantee you this. You'll also probably get family members that'll come and ask you questions as well. That can be a bit annoying. But the court system is structured in such a way is to really uphold this idea the citizen can go to the court and represent themselves. Okay? Knowing how the system works and knowing the legal issues and being able to actually understand what's happening is a massive, massive source of advantage for you in those times when it does come up. And so... Uh, I guess that's the one sort of parting thing that I come for you guys. You know, most of you guys are not going to be lawyers, I hope. Oh, please don't. Um, but take away as much as you can from this for the times that you are going to have to engage with the legal system itself. It's a, it's a set of skills that's really, really helpful. Um, and just in terms of your life, it, this is going to happen, um, sadly. For, hopefully for good things, but unfortunately, usually not. So I'll leave that uh, for you guys. Yeah, the other people have got other things to say about lawyers, but um, I'll leave that for American sitcoms. Thanks, team. I, um, I hope that wasn't too painful. And I'll end the, end the stream. I'm going to end the stream. Something.